Shalom Laverne. Uh, I want to briefly address some of the things you said uh, in your video. Now you know, you know from me, we we both share a lot of beliefs. We have a lot of the same grounding in what how we understand scripture and what we understand as the truth. Um, but I do believe you are in error over this issue regarding Paul. Um, though I am interested in watching your second video, so I hope to, I hope you make that second video soon so I, I can watch it. Um, but basically, um, I, I just want to say I agree with you a lot of a lot of the things that you said in this video. There, so many people elevate Paul above the rest of the scriptures and they twist his they well you might not believe they twist his words but they make his words say things that are contrary to the rest of the scriptures and they don't care because they pick and choose from the scriptures what they want to believe and they justify their own sin through this method which is abominable the truth is, if any scripture, be it actual scripture or false, be it anything, a prophet of God, an angel, anyone who teaches anything, if it's not moral, if it's not righteous, if it's not true, then it must be rejected, even if it's the commandments of God himself, even if it's the very word of God. We cannot accept the things that are false and evil. So, I do agree with you that if Paul does indeed teach these things you, th you think he is teaching, then he should be rejected. Because no false prophet and no teacher of wickedness is of God, is of good righteousness. Um, but with that said, I do believe you are misunderstanding Paul very much so. But I would prefer you to misunderstand Paul and reject him out of your misunderstanding than to realize what you think Paul is saying and then blindly accept what he says in contradiction to the rest of the scriptures. That just wouldn't be called for. It. That wouldn't be righteous. So I commend you for, I commend you for obeying righteousness rather than blindly holding on to Paul. That's good. Um, so let me just look at some of the things you said. Okay, and yes, uh, teachings of Christ for Jews, teachings of Paul for the Gentiles. I have heard that as well. The, uh, the whole the dispensationalism uh, has t different members taught that Christ did not teach against the law of the Moses. He didn't really teach what the true gospel message was. It was Paul. Who came after that um, abrogated the words of Christ and replaced them with his own teachings. But this of course is just contrary to the scriptures. The whole idea of the gospel is that this, you know, the, the narrative, the gospel of Matthew, the idea is that Matthew contains everything we need to know for the good news, how to be saved. Same thing with Mark, Luke, and John. But there is no gospel of Paul that I know of. Even in the Apocrypha, strangely enough, no Gospel of Paul. So, it appears that people are making his letters into the Gospel of Paul, but the, the Gospels themselves should be sufficient enough, one would think, but they, a lot of them think not. Uh, so anyway, um, Um, okay, just w one quick thing, but you're probably going to mention this in your next video, is the whole thing about where Paul, Paul teaches salvation by faith and not of works. Okay, um, yes, this, this teaching is, as it is commonly understood, is very evil. I say that as it is commonly understood. What Paul actually meant, however, is a completely different thing than what people think. Remember, Paul comes from a an Hebraic culture and does not, and he didn't have any of that baggage of 
like brainwashing and indoctrination by preachers to how to interpret the Bible. So with all that out of the way, when people used to read it in the ancient times, they didn't have all of these thoughts entering their head. Paul was more easily understood. And the whole thing about faith without works is not referencing what Christians say today, that it's a belief, our belief saves us. No, that's not what it is at all. Rather, what is it that saves us? For instance, um, circumcision. Now, circumcision has been ob has been required for salvation ever since the time of Abraham. And the scriptures teach that circumcision will never be abolished. So it will always still be required to enter into the covenant of salvation. With that being said, is it physical circumcision itself, or in other words, works, that saves you? Or is it your heart, your, which actually in Hebrew, there is, it's not heart, it's mind. Is it, or is it your mind which is choosing the will to become circumcised? In other words, the obedience comes from your, your mind, not from your body. Your body fulfills the obedience that your mind is choosing to do. So in this sense, it is faith that saves us and not the works. It's not our body that saves us, it's our mind that saves us. This is what Paul is teaching. However, if you sin with the body, you're sinning with your mind. And it's not because the body did something evil, but it's because your mind did something evil through your body. That is the whole idea of faith. So, and Paul was trying to, he was trying to tell us that, um, he was trying to tell us that it doesn't matter if we're Jew or Gentile. That doesn't matter. What matters is if we obey God or not. So it's not about the body. It's not about our genetic code, our works. It's not about that. It's about righteousness. It's about the faith. Now, what is faith? In Hebrew, faith is not what English people say it is. Most English Christians say faith is belief in something with no evidence to support it. Or basically, it's essentially blind faith. But the true meaning of faith is has nothing to do with whether or not there is evidence. Rather, faith is merely confidence in the truth of something. So if I have faith that you are going to watch this entire video, that is confidence that you're going to do it. You may, there may not be any reason that I believe that you're going to watch this video. So that would be a, a faith that's not grounded in anything with no evidence. But there's other kinds of faith slash confidence where there is the supporting evidence that and that doesn't make it not faith because it's still confidence we're still trusting in this tr the trustworthiness of of it being the case so and also works in, uh, in the hebrew or if you want to say greek but even though it wasn't written in greek originally but let's just say it was the original languages of the scriptures differ significantly from the English. So I feel that a lot of these te a lot of these things that people find wrong with the scriptures are based on bad English translations and corrupt manuscripts, okay? So I just urge you to forget about English and I you should as I am doing seek to learn the original languages of the scriptures because that is the only way we can truly know what they were trying to tell us otherwise our these english words with these horrible negative connotations that the author never intended just seep into the text it's not good 
it's it's contrary to the intent of the authors of scripture so anyway, i can probably go into that more in the next video assuming you make this at part two then i can respond to that but uh so you mentioned you know beware the yeast of the pharisees it still needs to be maintained it still mean, needs to be demonstrated that all the pharisees were bad because there's a common idea to believe that but do we have the evidence that the pharisees were all believing a specific thing or was it a pharisee much more of a broad term just like christian is today christian carries so much meaning and it could mean almost any type of various differences but that still maintain that there is a christ in a similar way a pharisee i i believe that in the ancient past Pharisee was a very broad term. Uh, there were very w wide nuances of beliefs and things of that nature. Um, but yeah, so uh, you, you describe, uh, you know, the beast is described as different ent empires such as Greek and Roman. Paul is both a Pharisee and a Roman. Um, and of course, it's from the tribe of Benjamin. However, I see the flaw in this. I see is that this is committing the fallacy of association, basically. And this is the idea of works, where because he's a Roman, because he's a Benjaminite, he is automatically a false prophet. But I can't. I don't think we can do that. We can't say that because of the way he was born that makes him wrong and furthermore the prophecy of christ about the raven ravenous wolves i do not believe was narrowly specific to just the tribe of benjamin the language is connected there yes it is the the, this, the same words are used however was it, is it just false prophets that are coming from benjamin no and not all benjaminites are false prophets so we we need to be very clear and confident before we can claim that someone is a false prophet just because of their national heritage that so really what me and probably all the other viewers who are going to try to and consider your points fairly with open-mindedness we are really searching for you to show how Paul's teachings are contrary to the truth. How Paul is a false prophet by his work, by his, you know, by his fruit, and not by his heritage. Because it's really the, it's the fruit that makes someone a false prophet, not their origin. So that's what I think we really are hoping to see from you, Laverne. So try to focus just on that and rather than his origin when you do your second part two video. Anyway, um, if Paul, as in conclusion, uh, if Paul does indeed teach things you believe he teaches in that they are contrary to the truth, then you are right to reject him and everyone must reject all false prophets, including even if it was God himself. We must reject all teachers of evil. So I commend you, Laverne, for your boldness and your willingness to obey what you believe is the truth, despite the what other people are going to say about it. That being said, willingness to be different and boldness to stand, stand solitary against the rest of the world doesn't in and of itself make you correct. But of course, I'm... You know this already, but I'm just saying this for just in case for any other viewers and just as a reminder for you, but I know you know. So really, we, I really hope to see some interesting points you have to say about Paul's specific teachings being wicked fruit. Anyways, this is the end of the video. Thank you and Shalom. So this is the first in my series of videos in which I am hoping to show you primarily that 
all the apostles and all the followers of the Messiah in the early first century, everyone that knew Paul, that everyone that knew Paul and originally thought he was saved, continued to believe he was saved until the very end. In all the writings that have survived, um, that make specific references to Paul. Um, now I know you mentioned, like for instance, the letter of James. And unfortunately, I don't have anything from James about Paul. Nothing specific. Now, I know you say his teachings go against the teachings of Paul. But, um... I, I, don't, I don't think that is uh, true, but I don't have anything specifically about um, James addressing explicitly Paul. So, I won't be dealing with James' letter in these series of videos, but, well, you know, I might continue the series of videos by expanding it and adding some, yeah, you know, I, I, after I do this series of videos, I will then um, address the teachings of Paul a after I see some more of your videos which address some of Paul's teachings that you disagree with. So I will be addressing James, but not in this first part where I discuss, I show how all the apostles that did write of him, approved of him, always. So with that said, allow me to uh, start. Now I'm, I'm starting first with the Acts of the Apostles, and this is going to be the bulk of, my, of all these videos, the Acts of the Apostles. With that said, allow me to begin. Um, according to the very in introduction of the book of Acts, we, we understand that Theophilus, a man named Theophilus, accepted the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel, I mean, excuse me, and the book of Acts. Because Luke wrote the book of Acts to Theophilus. So Luke was assuming that Theophilus would agree with the message Luke was trying to teach uh, to, to Theophilus. So we know that Theophilus was uh, someone that Luke approved of. I, I will mention Theophilus later because Theophilus... Um, approves of Paul later, which I have shown in one of Paul's letters that didn't make it into the Bible. Alright, so I'll continue now. Um, okay, so the Virgin Mary. It's a, in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, um, it says that Mary, it shows that Mary was faithful originally, at least. And participated in the ministry. She is described as praying, being uh, actively in prayer for the for the uh, brothers. So the Virgin Mary, it is has a role in the early church, but I, much later. Um, um, much later, I will show that the Virgin Mary. Um, I will show someone else much later who approves of the Virgin Mary, and that person believes that Paul never, uh, never stopped, um, Paul never stopped being a true follower of God, and I will show that that Virgin Mary approves of that person. So a Virgin Mary approves of someone who believed that Paul uh, never stopped being a true follower of God. Therefore, Mary believes that Paul, Mary believed till her death that Paul was always a true follower of God, which I'll show later. Next is Justice. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 23, this shows that Justice was one of the true followers of God originally. But as, a, as well, Justice, I will show later on, Justice also approves of Apostle Paul to, to the end. Um, 
Okay, um, Acts chapter 4, verse 16 to 17, which is um, Barnabas. We see that Barnabas, according to Luke, Barnabas was originally a true follower of God, at least at this time in the narrative of the book of Acts. Then we see in Acts chapter 6, verses 2 to 6, that the twelve apostles were at least originally the primary leaders of the church. After this, they pick seven prominent men to be deacons. These men are Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. Nicholas is the man that is, has his name infamously attributed to the Nicolaitans, who John, in his revelation, uh, rebukes. That is the Nicolaitans, the heresy of the Nicolaitans. One moment. Uh, the Nicolaitans were pleasure seekers and believed that they were supposed to abuse the flesh. Um, by sinning, which and that 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 was a good thing in their mind. But uh, one of the later writers, I don't know if I had this quote in this video, so I'm just gonna say what he said. I mean, not in this video. I don't know if I had the quote in my documents that I wrote up, but um, basically, Ignatius of Antioch, the Bishop of Antioch. Okay, Ignatius. Um, he wrote that, um, one moment again. Okay, he wrote that, uh, the, that Nicholas was not the originator of these, this movement called the Nicolaitans. That he, it was falsely attributed to Nicholas, Nicholas, that Nicholas was always a true man of God, according to Ignatius. If you want some of the, if you're questioning some of these things and you want to see the actual, like s later on when I discuss Ignatius and Dionysius, I won't have quotations of, I mean, I have quotations, but I won't have the reference numbers from where I'm taking the quotations, just the book that I'm taking it from. So if you want the, the, the references, the reference numbers, then just let me know, and I will send you those reference numbers. At any rate, we see that these deacons were faithful. According to Ignatius, at least Nicholas remained faithful. Um, and was not the starter of Nicolaitans. Anyways, I'm getting off topic, so I'm going to go to the next part. So, okay, we can agree... We should be able to agree that the first eight chapters of the book of Acts de depicts Paul as a very evil man. We, I think this is undeniable. Now, the following passage from Acts chapter 9 is very significant. Now, this is the passage that talks about Paul's conversion. However, this is Luke describing it. Luke describes this. Which in the, in the word, alright, so I'll read this. It says, this is what I wrote. Here we see that Luke evidently believed that, the, that this account of conversion actually happened to Paul. He does not say that Paul claimed these things to happen, but Luke words it especially saying that these things actually happened. And so Luke tells us that the Messiah himself actually spoke to Paul and told him to stop persecuting him. Uh, and after Paul asked him what he needed to do, the Messiah told him to go to Damascus. So keep in mind that this account of Paul's conversion in the book of Acts of the Apostles is true, according to Luke, and accurate. We can conclude from this that Paul actually had this divine experience. Okay? Now, we'll continue. Later on, it goes to discuss that Ananias also had a, a, uh, a vision to go and help Paul. 
so it says, so after we read this passage from Ananias all the way to verse 18, read it to verse 18, so we can learn from this that this passage shows us that according to Luke, God was responsible for Paul recovering from blindness through the true follower of Messiah whose name was Ananias. Not only this, but it also tells us that according to Luke, God himself explicitly expressed that God chose Paul to be his chosen vessel. That Paul was a chosen vessel of God to preach the true faith to the Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. It also connects to this uh, preaching that Paul must suffer for the true faith. This means that at least until before Paul suffered great things, he was still a true follower of God. You may question this, but you have to just read, just read verses, verses 10 to uh, 18 of chapter 9, and you see that Paul indeed Everything I just said about Paul is true, where it says, um, I, I'm going to quote <clears throat> from it. It says, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, meaning Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. <clears throat> so that is God clearly approving of Paul, at least at this point in the narrative. Okay? Now we'll continue with the same chapter. Um, so verses... This next part is about verses 26 to 29 of that same chapter. According to this passage, the early disciples were hesitant to accept Paul as a true follower of God, but Barnabas himself accepted him fully and urged everyone else to do so. Such a prominent man as Barnabas indicates that the major leaders of the church all approved of Paul at this point in the history of the church. And Luke then says that Paul boldly spoke in the name of the Lord. This is an approval of Paul by Luke, at least at this point in, t in time in the church history. <clears throat> okay, so... Chapters 10 through 11 discuss Peter's view of the Gentiles being changed. You know, with the whole thing with the vision of the food. Uh, this proves that the, the Peter in Paul could not be the Peter in this account, because otherwise there would be a, a contradiction. So either Luke is wrong, Paul is wrong, or there were two Peters. For the book of Acts says that it was God sending a vision to Peter, which showed him that he should not separate from Gentiles and call them unclean simply because they are Gentiles. According to Galatians, however, it was Paul's rebuke of Peter that led to Peter realizing he had to stop separating from Gentiles and calling them unclean simply because they were Gentiles. The two accounts are not reconcilable if they refer to the same Peter. I'm getting close to the 15 minute mark, so I'm going to end my vid video here, and I will continue this analyzation of Paul. Uh, thank you, and shalom. Okay, part two, I now begin, and I will continue where I left off from the previous video. Uh, so now we're going to go to, I, I think this is chapter 11, verses 22 to 24. Okay, so according to this passage, Luke believed that Barnabas at the point in time in the narrative being discussed was a true follower of God. To use Luke's own words, Barnabas was a good, a quote unquote, uh, I'm quoting now, was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. He also attributes to Barnabas Massive amounts of conversions to the true faith. So still, Barnabas is a very prominent man in the early church. Okay? Now we proceed to verses 25 to 26. 
This passage shows us that Barnabas, being a follower of the true faith, approved of Paul at this point in the narrative. Because it shows, let's see, um, yeah, because Barnabas journeys with Paul as his spiritual companion, his brother in the ministry. Next, in, in Acts chapter 12, verses 13 to 14, we see that Rhoda, at this point in the narrative, was a true follower of Messiah. Later on, I'm going to do one very small quote. Um, actually, no, I don't. I don't have it included in a quotation. So, so I'll just mention it now. The man, the the early leader in the church, known as Hermas, who wrote the, the most important book of Scripture called the Shepherd of Hermas. He uh, was rebuked by Rhoda many years later. If I, I'm pretty sure the chronology is many years later. Yeah. So Rhoda rebuked him. And Rhoda was formerly his slave owner. Okay. Now in this, if I remember correctly, I think she might actually be a slave of someone else. So later on, she becomes freed and then she owns Hermas at the beginning. But then Hermas is freed later on. So Rhoda... Now, and always, remain a true follower of God. At least in this point of the narrative, Rhoda approved of Paul. Okay. Um, Acts chapter 12, verse 25. That passage shows that Barnabas still approved of Paul. And likewise, Paul, Barnabas. And that Mark also approved of Paul. Seeing as how Mark journeyed with them as their companion in the ministry. He must have regarded both of them as spiritual brothers to journey with them. So it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So it's right there, everything I just said is supported by the text. Now, Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. That passage is also significant in that Luke explicitly says, that Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menaean, and Saul, otherwise known as Paul, were all prophets. And that the Holy Spirit explicitly commanded that Barnabas and Saul were to be separated from the rest of them to, for the work of ministry. Also that the Holy Spirit sent Paul and Barnabas to specific places for preaching the gospel. Evidently, Luke here teaches that Paul was still a true follower of the Messiah. Otherwise, he wouldn't be accepted by Christ. For the Paul of the Old Testament, King Saul, upon ceasing to follow God, lost the Holy Spirit. The same should be the case for Paul, if he stopped being a follower of God. So, since he still has the Holy Spirit here, this also uh, proves that Luke considered Paul a true brother at this point in the narrative. I'm going to read a little bit from the passage I'm referring to. So, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had brought up with, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, "Separate me." Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John to their minister. So Apostle John as well approved of them. Uh, in chapter 13, Luke says, that the fo says the following verse, verse 9. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimaeus, Elimaeus and said, okay, so right, right there. According to this passage, what Paul spoke in rebuke of Elimaeus was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul also blinds him through the power of the Holy Spirit in this narrative, if you re read later on. 
So evidently, Luke thought Paul was still too fuller at this point. He is attributing the Holy Spirit to him and, many, and miracles and that he's speaking the, through the Holy Spirit. Later in chapter 13, Barnabas is still the companion of Paul in the ministry, indicating, indicating that uh, Barnabas still approved of Paul at this point and, as a true follower of God. In response to Paul's controversial preaching, some of the Jews of that region expelled Paul and Barnabas from their region. According to Luke, as verse 52 indicates, the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Link, Luke links this joy in the Holy Spirit filling specifically to Paul and Barnabas' ministry, indicating Luke believed at this point Paul was still a true follower because the Holy Spirit was filling people because of Paul's work. Now, uh, Acts chapter 14 verses 1 to 3. In this passage, Luke says that Paul and Barnabas boldly spoke in the Lord and that God granted, granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands as a testimony of their God's grace. Luke evidently believed Paul was still a true follower of God at this point. So I'll read it. It says, And it came to pass in Iconium that they, they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude both of the Jews and also the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. A long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Acts chapter 14 verses 19 to 23. In this passage, Barnabas approves still of Paul. As a true follower of God, Luke also claims that Paul and Barnabas both exhorted the disciples um, and uh, to continue in the true faith. He also indicates that they were responsible for ordaining elders in every assembly of the true faith. At the very end, Luke says that Paul and Barnabas com commended the disciples to the Lord. And more significantly, that Paul and Barnabas did in fact believe on Messiah, as Luke says. I'm quoting them. On whom they believed. On God whom they believed. Barnabas and Paul, that is. So right here, they're still accepted as true followers of God. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to read those verses, but just read those verses that I mentioned. And you'll see verses 19 to 23 of chapter 14. Everything I just said is correct. Now, Paul and Barnabas, according to chapter 15, spoke in unison with James and Peter when the council was going on, and that they heard everything Peter and James concluded should be done. All right, we see that Paul and Barnabas were there the entire time for the council, so they heard all the things that they that James and Peter had to say, and they also, Paul and Barnabas even spoke as spokesmen during this council. If you read the chapter, you'll see that. So, now, verses 22-23, read as followers, follows. Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their co own company to Antioch with Paul and and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. So, notice that the apostles and elders, which would include Peter and James, decided to send Paul and Barnabas, Barsabas, and Silas as the deliverers of the letter of this council to the other churches. Notice also that Luke says that all four of these men were at that time chief men among the brethren. This indicates Luke approved of all four of them as followers of God at this time of history. This narrative discourse uh, discusses. Um, now I'll continue with verses 23. Um, 
to 29. The apostles and elders send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, all seems good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Our beloved, he said. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if you keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. Once again, in verses 25 to 27, we see that Paul and Barnabas, and Barshavis and Silas, all were chosen by the apostles as the trusted brothers to deliver this important letter to the churches. Not only this, but they specifically say in verse 25 that the apostles, elders, and these four men assembled with one accord. They also say that Paul and Barnabas risked their lives for the sake of God's kingdom, and that this was wonderful testimony to their faith in God and their authority. Barsabas and Silas are prominent enough leaders that they joining Paul and Barnabas is a guarantee that this letter is of God. Notice also that Paul and Barnabas, as well as Barsabas and Silas, all claimed at this time to be in agreement with this letter. Otherwise, they would not have sent it. And this letter specifically contains the prohibition of eating things sacrificed to idols. So at this time, the apostles and elders still believe that Paul was a man of the true faith. Um, verses 30 to 35. Paul and Barnabas then deliver the letter, okay? and read it after they gathered the multitude of the church to hear its words. And the hearers rejoiced upon hearing the letter's content. Luke shows his approval of Barsabas and Silas at the time, whom he describes at this point in the narrative as prophets, indicating that not only did they exhort the spiritual brothers, but also confirmed them, he says, Luke. Silas was so invested in his ministry, however, that there he decided to stay for a time. And this statement is significant. Luke says that they continued in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. He, he refers to that to be Barnabas and Paul. They continued in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. Therefore, what Paul and Barnabas teach was in fact the truth of God and the true faith. Still, and this is after Acts chapter 15. This indicates that at this point, Paul was not teaching anything that wasn't the word of the Lord, but was, but what he preached was still approved of by God, as it was all the word of the Lord. Okay, getting close to the 15 minute mark, so I'm going to end this video. Thank you and shalom. Okay, this is part three in my video series of Defending Paul. So now verses 36 to... Uh, 41 of chapter 15. Now, this is the first major passage that you are in disagreement over, Laverne, if I understand correctly. We know at this point, Barnabas and Paul part ways because they disagree with each other on whether or not Mark should accompany them. Accompany them. Here, however, Luke offers us an explanation as to why Paul did not want to bring Mark. It was because... Paul was not sure if ministry was what God was calling Mark to. How do we know this? Because Mark, uh, Paul, Paul, Luke says the reason Paul didn't was hesitant to bring Paul because Mark didn't go with them before when they, he asked him to. So he was doubting whether or not Mark was suited for the ministry. Perhaps. Uh, Perhaps Mark was suited for something else, so he didn't want to bring Mark if that wasn't his calling spiritually. 
Uh, Barnabas, however, was convinced that Mark was called to this ministry of preaching. And so he brought, um, he brought Mark along with him. But so Paul disagreed and was, well, he wasn't convinced. So to be safe, he brought Silas with him instead and they parted ways. So we see here that Barnabas and Mark approved of each other and also that Paul and Silas evidently approved of each other because they both journeyed together. According to Luke, in verse 41 of this chapter, we see that Paul confirmed into the true faith the churches of Syria and Cilicia. Just read verse 41. It says that specifically. If Luke deemed this incident to be a negative aspect of Paul, it apparently was not given much importance in Luke's mind because Luke still thinks here that Paul is a true follower of God at this point in the narrative because he explicitly says in verse 41 that Paul's preaching throughout the churches confirmed the churches in the true faith. If Paul was at this point a wolf in sheep's clothing, they would not be confirmed in the true faith, but would be confirmed in deception and condemnation. So, so I believe that this incident over Mark was not a matter of non-forgiveness of Mark, but rather was trying to follow what the Spirit was saying. Paul wasn't convinced that, that this was Mark's calling to be in the ministry. So he was trying to obey the Spirit, and the Spirit didn't tell him that Mark's ministry was preaching. So he was trying to play it safe and not do anything contrary to God's will. However, Barnabas did, in fact, receive from the Spirit the teaching that Mark was to join him in the ministry. Um, so I'll continue now. From Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 5. It is at this point that Timothy and Paul first become connected explicitly. This shows us that at this time Timothy approves of Paul. For Timothy submitted to Paul, allowing Paul to circumcise, quote-unquote, him. This was another passage you cited as being contrary to the truth. But I can tell you that there is more than one kind of circumcision. Why do I believe this? Because in Hebrew, there is no actual word that means circumcised. But only a word that means cut off. Which is often... The word in Hebrew is often, but not always, translated as circumcised. So that means it can't mean circumcised, because if it did, then they would always translate it as circumcised. But since they don't always, then it clearly can't only mean this. And the truth is, if you look at all the time, if you look at all the different ways they translate this Hebrew word, it doesn't mean circumcised, but it clearly means cut off. Sometimes referring to the foreskin being cut off, and sometimes referring to other things being cut off. Like, for instance, circum uncircumcised uh, lips refers to the lips uh, not being cut off. You know, when Paul, I mean, when Moses couldn't speak very well, uh, according to Exodus, he wasn't very bold in speaking. Probably maybe shy, I don't know. But so, uncircumcised lips First, to the fact that they're not being cut off. So they're clothed. They're not cut off. If they were cut off, then he'd be speaking. But since they're not clothed, they're uncircumcised, quote unquote, or they're not cut off, which is what the Hebrew actually says. Uncircumcised ears. The ears are not being cut off from the evil things. That's what uncircumcised ear means. Okay. Similarly, uh, similarly, un, um, cir circumcised, uh, circumcised, ma a heart. Circumcised hearts is not referring to an allegorical circumcision. Circumcision of the heart refers to your heart being cut off from evil things. It's a literal, it's literal circumcision, but it's literal circumcision of the heart. It's not allegorical circumcision, it's not symbolic circumcision, it's not metaphorical circumcision. It's actual circumcision of the heart. 
or in other words, is actual cutting off. That's what the Hebrew says, actual cutting off of the heart from evil things. That's what circumcision of the heart is in Hebrew. So, also, um, it's, it refers to fruit as uncircumcised in Leviticus chapter 19. Uh, how can fruit be circumcised if it doesn't have a foreskin? Obviously, this shows that circumcision has a broader meaning. It refers to being cut off. So, it says you're, you are to regard um, the fruit as uncircumcised. What this means for the first three years. What this means is you are to regard it as not being able to be eaten. Okay? It's not for food. Um, anyways, I'm going to continue. Um, so, with this, what I just showed you from the Hebrew, I'm going to declare you here my belief that the circumcision in this passage is not circumcision, but is actually referring to a different kind of cutting off. Um, yeah. let me see here. Specifically of that being cut off from the Gentiles. The, what I mean, cutting off from the Gentiles being cut off from the citizenry of the Gentile nations. The evidence for this here uh, Alright, see ya. Alright. Um, the evidence for this here is that Paul circumcised Timothy because his father was Greek. If this is referring to regular circumcision or regular cutting off that of the foreskin, then how does Timothy's father being a Greek have anything to do with whether or not Timothy is circumcised? The answer is it doesn't. But this makes perfect sense when we realize that Timothy was a Greek citizen. Because his father was a Greek citizen, since the father in ancient times determined what country you were a citizen of. And so because Timothy was still a Greek, Paul decides to cut Timothy off, legally speaking, from the citizenry of the Gentiles and enrolled him as an Israelite instead. Also supporting this is that the circumcision was supposed to be for the benefit of the Jews they would be preaching to. But if Paul had been circumcised, his foreskin that is, in this account, how would the community of the, the Jews that they're preaching to ever know that Timothy was circumcised? Circumcision is a private matter and it's very hard to establish whether or not a person is circumcised without violating their God-given right to privacy. This is why in the book of Joshua, they found out after all the sinful fathers had died in the desert, that all the children born in the desert had not been circumcised. They only found this out years and years later. So since circumcision, and they found this out after Moses died, that all the children were uncircumcised. So since circumcision is an extremely private thing, and can't be proven unless someone streaks naked, Timothy simply was not circumcised by Paul in the traditional sense, but rather was cut off from the Gentiles by becoming a citizen of Israel instead of a citizen of a Gentile nation, which this kind of cutting off was entirely observable by the people. Okay, now let's, let's say you reject everything I just said. But, if you do, then what do you do with the following verses in that same passage? Verses 4 to 5. And as they went through the cities, they delivered from the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased, and increased in number daily. According to these verses, Luke believed that when Paul circumcised Timothy, he also taught the people to 
uh, to keep all the decrees that the apostles and elders at Jerusalem had commanded. And Luke says also that due to Paul's preaching, the churches were established in the true faith. This indicates that at this time, Paul still believed, uh, I mean, excuse me, Luke still believed Paul was teaching the people to adhere to the true faith, or in other words, being established in the faith. Also, one quick thing. The introduction of Timothy here proves that before these events, 1 Timothy, 2 Corinthians, and Philemon could not have been written because all refer to Paul and Timothy's joint ministry, which only occurred after this event. I mention this because in those letters specifically, it discusses different men who approved of Paul at the time he wrote that letter. At any rate, I'll continue. Verses 6 to uh, 10 of the same chapter. Here, Luke says that the Holy Spirit prevented Paul from preaching in certain places. And not only this, but that Paul received a vision of a man of Macedonia, who told Paul that he needed to go over to Macedonia. Luke then indicates that right after Paul had the vision, they all left with Paul for Macedonia. We see the first person plural being used, the we. Since Luke wrote the book of Acts, whenever the book says we outside of quotations, Luke is intending to include himself in those involved. Thus, according to Luke, immediately after Paul received the vision of the man of Macedonia, and Paul relayed the vision's contents, Luke went with Paul to Macedonia. This indicates that Luke trusted Paul still, and believed he was one of the followers of the true faith in this, at this point. Otherwise, he would not have so quickly gone with Paul and joined him in his ministries. But Luke here immediately leaves with Paul, simply because Paul said he had a vision that, they, that said that he needed to go. This indicates a very high level of trust in Luke's eyes of Paul, at least at this time in the narrative. Not only this, but Luke says in those same verses that Luke and the rest of the others had concluded because of Paul's vision that the Lord wanted them to go to Macedonia with Paul, and thus left immediately. Luke said, I quote, Assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us forth to preach the gospel unto them. And they gathered this because Paul had seen the vision. For some reason, Luke still approves of Paul at this point in the narrative. And, um... And I'll read it a little bit. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not, and they passed by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, Assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. I'm getting close to the 15 minute mark, so I'll end this video. Thank you and shalom. Alright, so this is a part 5 in my series of videos of Defending Paul. In chapter 21, Paul and Luke, with others, travel as spiritual companions. After a prophet comes to Paul and declares that the Holy Spirit says Paul will be handed over to the Jews, Luke and the others plead with Paul to not go. Their pleading is uncharacteristic of someone that is not their spiritual brother. They act with Paul in such a way that they still approve of him as a brother, and that's why they don't want him to go. Acts chapter 21, verse 16. This passage shows that Manasin, one of the earliest disciples of the true followers of God, accepted Paul and the apostles as brothers at this point. Verses 17 to 18 of Acts, uh, to 19 of Acts chapter 21. Luke here portrays Paul as going with Luke and the other true followers of God to James and the elders, and that Paul greeted them. James would not greet them if they rejected him as a spiritual brother. Not only this, but Paul confides in them regarding the ministry, what things God had done through Paul, that is. This would have been quite inappropriate had Paul not been regarded by them as their spiritual brother. But as every next verse after this says, 
when they heard what Paul said, they glorified, oh, not every, when the next verse after that says, when they heard what Paul said, they glorified the Lord, they would not glorify the Lord after hearing what God supposedly did to someone they believed to be a false prophet or teacher, but only rather that someone they accepted as a true brother would they rejoice in the Lord. I'll read verses 8, 17 to 18. It says, And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with, with us unto James and the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. Now, going on, verses 20 to 22. What, and when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it, therefore? According to this passage, James and the elders uh, are making sure Paul has not left the true faith. A rumor started that Paul taught that the Gentiles do not have to keep the law of Moses. But after hearing Paul's report personally, James was convinced that this was slander. As the rest of the passage says, says that, uh, that um, notice that James says that thousands of Jews believe and all are zealous of the law of Moses. This is portrayed by James as a good thing. And not only this, but that James also considers the Gentiles forsaking Moses as a bad thing, and that the Gentiles not circumcising their children, and also not walking after the customs of the law of Moses as a bad thing as well. So verses 22 to uh, 26 reads, The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that that thou are come. Do therefore this that we say to, to thee. We have four men which have taken a vow. Them take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads. And all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest according orderly, and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, and from blood, and from strangled, and from fornication. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself <clears throat> with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification, until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I was quoting from the King James Version. The New King James Version has a footnote that says, uh, that um, they observe no such thing is not in the earlier manuscripts. So that is an addition, by the way. So it should read, we have concluded, we have written and concluded that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from things blood and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Not that they should not observe such thing. That's not part of the original. So sorry for reading that. But anyways, so this is an amazing passage. This whole passage is evidently quite clear. The results of Acts chapter 15 council confused people because it appeared to undereducated people <clears throat> that the council had concluded that the law of Moses did not have to be kept to be saved and that they did not have to be circumcised to be saved. That's what it appeared to be. Thus, in order to prove that this was not what the council meant at all, they commanded Paul to fulfill the Nazarite vow from the law of Moses along with the others who had taken the same vow. And that this would show that the true interpretation of the Acts chapter 15 council, in which the four commandments, blood, fornication, strangling, and idols, were prohibited, but that this did not make the law of Moses no longer needed to be kept. Rather, it showed that the oral law of Moses did not have to be kept, and that the circumcision I described earlier, in which Timothy was circumcised from the Gentiles, not the circumcision of the foreskin, was not required for salvation. Here, we see also that Paul reaffirmed the approval of the Four Commandments from the Oral Torah that they agreed with, that being a prohibition of offered, meat offered to idols, 
uh, strangled, blood, and fornication. So if you doubt the existence of the oral law in ancient times, I'm going to quote to you right now from the Damascus document, which explicitly condemns the oral law of Moses. The builders of the wall, who walk after the law, the law it is which talks. Of which, he said, assuredly they shall talk, are caught by fornication and taking two wives during their lifetimes. Damascus document condemns the law and then clarifies and says, well, we mean the oral law. So you see that right there. It's ancient testification. Modern Orthodox Jews claim the oral law was given also by Moses from the Wikipedia Encyclopedia. Rabbinic Judaism holds that the books of the Tanakh were transmitted in parallel with an oral tradition as relayed by God to Moses and from him handed on to the scholarly and other religious leaders of each generation. I quoted that from Wikipedia. All of this shows that after Paul uh, indicated he did not teach against the law of Moses um, and did not teach against the Council of Acts chapter 15, James, the elders, and Luke all approved of him as a true follower of God at this time. Acts chapter 21 verse 29, we see here that Trophimus is represented as approving of Paul as a true follower of God. Now, to one of the passages you, now, to one of the passages that you find most fault with, the account of Paul's conversion, retold by Paul himself. Acts chapter 22 does not contradict the others, however, when reciting the quotation of Jesus. Rather, Acts chapter 22 quoted a portion of Messiah's words, whereas the other to preserve a fuller quotation. Acts chapter 22, however, does contradict the other account in Acts chapter 9. For chapter 22 says that the men did not hear the voice, but Acts chapter 9 says that they did hear a voice. How can this be resolved? Firstly, just to say, it is unrealistic to believe that Paul forgot his own authentic testimony, which was proved authentic by Luke's endorsement of it as I showed earlier. It, also, it is also unprofitable for him to misrepresent his testimony by changing the fact that the man heard a voice. That wouldn't help his heresies anymore. It wouldn't do nothing for him. So at any rate, back to the answer. The answer is that there are many errors, demonstrably so, in the Greek manuscripts, as these are copies of copies of the originals. And not only this, but the Greek of the New Testament is a translation of the original Hebrew of the New Testament. Now, you might say to me that leaning on the bad translation argument might be a cop-out, but I will show you that Luke himself agrees with me that Paul is not a false prophet, but a true man of God, a brother, a follower of God. Acts chapter 23, verse 11, it says, And the night following the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. This is one of the most important of all things uh, that Luke says in this book in regards to whether or not Paul is a true man of God. Notice that Luke here clearly believes that God himself actually spoke to Paul and said to him, Be of good cheer, and as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, you must bear witness also in Rome. If Paul was a false prophet, God would be a liar to say, to Paul to be of good cheer after having become a false prophet and teacher. Furthermore, God had said to Paul, according to Luke, that Paul must be a witness in Rome so that he can testify of him. God would not be actively encouraging and creating sin, and therefore his words indicate that he, that is God, still approved of Paul, if indeed Luke is to be trusted. And to top it off, the way Luke narrates this event, he clearly believed God said this to Paul even after the events of chapter 22 and the earlier events of the chapter 23. Therefore, even at this point, Luke still believed Paul was a true follower of God. Acts chapter 24 verse 5. This passage shows that the unsaved Jews who observed the true followers of God, which in ancient times were known as the Nazarene sect, which was one of their many names for themselves, they perceived that Paul was a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. In other words, 
Paul was the leader of the true religion that they rejected, at least in their mind they did not perceive of any big falling out and division among the Nazarene sect, but that it was united as it had always been by the apostles of old and new. Acts 27 verses 1 and 2 Here Aristarchus is regarded as a true follower of God, since he was a companion of Luke. Later in Acts chapter 27 and also in verse uh, in, in chapter 28, we see that Paul and Luke were on the same boat, still companions of the true faith, and were stranded to an island called Malta. Luke continues to accompany Paul the entire way to Rome, and the brothers of the true faith are said to greet them both in verses 14 and 16 of chapter 28. And finally, in conclusion of the Acts of the Apostles, Luke ends with Paul's preaching for the good of the gospel. And Luke afterwards says that Paul, while uh, Paul stayed two years in Rome in his own rented house, he boldly, I'm quoting, boldly and with that interest preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, Luke, we see Luke still regarded Paul as a true follower of God in that Luke says Paul preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ, boldly even. We also must know that Luke concludes with Paul's words, which imply his, his endorsement of Paul even more, seeing that the con content of Paul's words, quoted by Luke, are intended to reinforce Luke's message, that being that the gospel was to be preached to all the Gentiles as well as the Israelites. That was the whole purpose of the book of Acts, to show that the Gentiles were also to be preached to. Luke never once condemns Paul in this book of Acts and always approves of him right until the very end of this book. We must conclude from this alone that either Luke was not a true follower of God in addition to Paul, or that they were both true followers of God. Okay, so according to Romans chapter 16, the following significant people, Paul was a true follower of God, at least until Paul sent this letter to the Romans. Priscilla, Aquila, Mary, Adronicus, uh, Rufus, Hermes, uh, yeah, so, so these are the people I highlight to you which are described elsewhere as important leaders of the true church of God. Priscilla and Aquila were very prominent in the book of Acts, Rufus becomes prominent in the church a while later, which I will show in later videos hopefully, and Hermes was a major leader of the church who wrote the most important book of all scripture yet, the Shepherd of Hermes. Not only this, but Paul also said in Romans chapter 16 that the following people send their greetings with the letter to the Romans that Paul wrote. In other words, the following people approved of the letter of Paul to the Romans, according to Romans chapter 16. Timothy, Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, Tertius, Gaius, Erastus, and Quartus. I'm getting close to the 15 minute mark, so I'm going to end this video. Thank you, and shalom. Okay, this is part six. Um, so, uh, continuing from the previous video, um, Timothy, Lucius, Sosipater, Gaius, and Erastus are all extremely significant individuals, being mentioned elsewhere as leaders of the church. Timothy, featuring prominently through Acts of Apostles and also in Paul's letters. Not only this, but Timothy is also mentioned by Barnabas in the letter of the Hebrews to the Hebrews. Timothy is very prominent later in the church as well. Lucius has a role later too. Sassabater was also still part of the leaders much later, and Gaius was well beloved, approved by essentially everyone, including the Apostle John. 1 Corinthians 1 1 shows that Paul and Sosthenes wrote the first letter of the Corinthians, indicating Sosthenes um, approved of everything in 1 Corinthians. Sosthenes was mentioned earlier in the Acts of the Apostles. Throughout 1 Corinthians, Paul shows that he was considered on par with Peter and Apollos, and that all three of them considered each other as faithful brothers of the Lord at that time. 1 Corinthians 4.17 indicates that Paul was accepted by Timothy at the time. 1 Corinthians... Um, uh, I'm not sure what this verse is. I, for, I, I think I misquoted it, but I misreferenced it. But in 1 Corinthians, we see that Paul baptized Gaius thereby making Paul Gaius' teacher. 1 Corinthians 8, 
verses 3, 3 to 6, we see that Barnabas and Cephas consider Paul still to be a true follower of God. Um, okay, so Timothy is Paul's spiritual brother according to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 10 to 11. Likewise, Apollos is Paul's spiritual brother in 1612. Apollos was prominent somewhat in the book of Acts of the Apostles. Stephan Stephanus Fortunus Fortunatus uh, and Achaicus are also regarded as Paul's brothers in Christ here. In addition, Aquila and Priscilla, who feature very prominently in the Acts of the Apostles, are said explicitly to endorse the letter of 1 Corinthians, in that they send their greetings through 1 Corinthians. According to 2 Corinthians 1.1, both Paul and Timothy wrote 2 Corinthians. Therefore, Timothy approved of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 1.19 indicates that Paul, Silas, and Timothy are all spiritual brothers at the time it was written. 2 Corinthians 2.12 says that Titus, is, Titus was Paul's brother spiritually at that time as well. Also, 2 Corinthians 7 to 6 to 7, 13 to 6, and 2 Corinthians 7, 6 to 24, and 2 Corinthians 12, 18 also indicate that Titus was Paul's brother spiritually at the time. Okay, in 3 Corinthians, Paul received a letter from Stephanus, Daphnis, Eubulus, Theophilus, and Zenon. These men all wrote a letter pleading for Paul to help them with a religious crisis. Thus, their own letter, which was included with 3 Corinthians manuscripts, proves that they regarded Paul as a true brother of Christ at that time. Okay. Um, Galatians approves of Peter, Barnabas, and Titus. Um, but here's something you need to know. Most people don't realize this, but did you know that there, in addition to the 12, there was also 70 people, 70 apostles handpicked by uh, the Messiah himself? The Gospel of Luke says this specifically. Now, early church tradition preserves lists, and some of the lists differ among the witnesses, but there's a list of who the 70 apostles were. In some of the lists, there we see that there was not only Paul the Apostle of the Twelve, but that there was also, I mean, excuse me, Peter, Apostle of the Twelve. There was also Peter, a disciple of the Seventy. So there was more than one Peter. According to the early church tradition, there was more than one Peter. Also, in the lists of Seventy, some lists include two Barnabases. So there was two more, at least two different Barnabases in the early church. So, I contend that Paul is not rebuking the famous Barnabas and the Apostle Paul of the Twelve. Paul is rebuking a second Peter and a second Barnabas. Do I have evidence to support this? Or is this just baseless um, speculation? I don't think so. Want to know why? Because in the Greek text, the English translations translate it as Peter throughout. However, there's footnotes in some of the in some of these versions that say that the Greek, like, I think it mentions Peter four times in the in the book of Galatians. Three of those times, the Greek says Cephas, not Peter. It says Cephas. But one of those four times, it says Peter, not Cephas. If it was referring to the same individual, why wouldn't it use the same one name? Why does it use two different names for the same one individual in this one passage of Galatians? So in other words, the translators translate these four, four times as Peter, but only three of the times in the Greek are Cephas, and one of the times is Peter. So, evidently, Galatians refers to a Peter and a Cephas, who are not the same person. Peter is the apostle um, that Paul is referring to. I mean, Peter is the apostle that Paul refers to as Peter, 
And Cephas is someone else entirely, the second Peter that Paul was rebuking. Study the Greek text, and I believe you will conclude that I have strong evidence for this case. In support of this, Acts, the book of Acts shows that the Apostle Peter was not rebuked by Paul, but was rebuked by God himself. So there's a clear difference. If Galatians is to be accepted as a historical, and so as well Acts of the Apostles, then it's necessarily so that there were two Peters, and I believe I demonstrated that this significantly, that this is so. Now, I'll continue. Ephesians 6, 21 says, Tychicus was Paul's spiritual brother at the time Ephesians was written. According to Philippians 1, 1, Paul and Timothy both together wrote Philippians, showing Timothy proved of Philippians' letter. In 2.25 it says, uh, Ephroditus is Paul's spiritual brother. In 4 verses 22 to 3, it says, Paul, Paul says, that Yodius, Syntyche, and Syzgis all were Paul's spiritual brothers. According to Colossians 1.1, Paul and Timothy both wrote the letter to the Colossians, showing Timothy approved of Colossians. 1.7 shows that Ephaphras was Paul's spiritual brother at this time. In chapter 4, Paul explicitly says that Tychicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Aristarchus, Mark, Justice, Epaphras, Luke, and Demas um, all approved of him. This uh, also testifies to the truth I showed with the Acts of the Apostles, that Luke approved of Paul throughout the entirety of the Acts of the Apostles. For Colossians was written near the end of Paul's life, and thus close to the very end of the Acts of the Apostles, while he is in prison, in fact. Archippus and Nympha were regarded as Paul's spiritual brothers at the time he wrote this letter as well, as chapter 4 indicates. Oh, by the way, the list I told you about Mark, Justice, um, I, Aristarchus, Onesimus, all those people, Paul says that they endorsed the letter to the Colossians, okay? I forgot to say that. So, okay, Paul also writes that the reader of Colossians should read his letter to the Laodiceans showing that all of these men also approved of Paul's letter to the Laodiceans. Both, um, both 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians were written by Paul, Timothy, and Silas, as indicated by these opening section, their opening sections. Thus, Silas and Timothy both approved of these two letters. 1 Timothy was written to Timothy, um, and thus shows that it, at that time Timothy was still in approval of Paul and submitted to him as his teacher and spiritual brother. 2 Timothy also was written to Timothy, but in addition, chapter 4, verses 9 to 14 tells us that Demas, Titus, and Crescens had to leave Paul for the sake of preaching the gospel where the Spirit led them. But in addition, Paul says that there, there that Luke is with him in agreement as his brother, and that Mark should be fetched and brought to him to help him out. Here we see that Paul did not have a vendetta against Mark, but said that Mark was useful for the ministry and thus requested him to join him as his brother in ministry. Tychicus also remained faithful to Paul, and Carpus also was regarded at this time as Paul's spiritual brother. And verses 19-21 show that Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, and Claudia all endorsed Paul's second letter to Timothy. In addition, Paul indicates that Priscilla, Aquila, Onsiphorus, Erastus, and Trophimus all were Paul's spiritual brothers at this, at this time. Paul wrote the, his letter to Titus, indicating they regarded each other at that time as spiritual brothers. Not only this, but also that Artemis, Tychicus, Zenus, and Apollos are regarded by Paul all as his spiritual brothers in chapter 2. Paul and Timothy wrote the letter to Philemon, according to the text. At that time, Philemon, Aphia, and Archippus were all regarded as the spiritual brothers of Paul, upon the time of this writing. Paul shows his concern for his spiritual brother Onesimus throughout the text. And more significantly, verse 23 explicitly says that Epaphras, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke all endorsed Paul's letter to Philemon. Now, Peter says in 1 Peter, in the final chapter, that Silas and Peter wrote 1 Peter, and that Mark 
explicitly endorse it. Silas and Mark connect to Paul, because elsewhere they are shown to approve of Paul until his death. And if that is true, then if they are accepted by Peter, that means Peter also accepted Paul. In addition, 2 Peter explicitly approves of Paul, and refers to his writings as scripture, and warns that his writings are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. Sounds like a perfect description of how people use Paul. Uh, this also shows that Jude approved of Paul, because 2 Peter was Peter's defense of the book of Jude. And he wouldn't defend Jude, uh, excuse me, he wouldn't defend Jude with someone who he believed was a false prophet. And 3 John also shows that John approved Gaius, um, which if Gaius approved of Paul, would also show John approved of Paul. Now, unfortunately I'm going to have to end my video here because my computer is almost out of battery less than five minutes and unfortunately I can't continue to show the historical witnesses that I wanted to show you so I'm gonna to have to do this tomorrow finish the rest tomorrow if you watched if you watch some of these videos sorry for that you're gonna to have to wait until the complete is finished um, and sorry for so many of these videos it's um, but I believe it's important and um, there's a lot more to show you a lot more of the early witnesses to show you all the early followers of Messiah the writings that have survived sh clearly show that Paul was approved of by them until the very end of uh, his life his ministry all the way to his martyrdom so I will be showing so in the next series of videos I'll be showing these other writings that didn't make it into the Bible which prove that Paul was a true follower of God, at least according to these early believers. These, you might be able to claim that these early believers were not true men of God, but this is what they claimed. This is what they believed. This is first century accounts I'll be showing you. At any rate, I'm going to have to end this video now because I'm about to lose power. So uh, thank you for watching these videos and I hope you watch this entire series. Shalom, this is Anna Yahoo. This is part seven in a series of videos in which I seek to defend Paul. Now, in the previous six videos, I showed from mostly the New Testament, except for the exception of 3 Corinthians, that according to the New Testament, uh, Paul isn't anywhere explicitly condemned, at least in the books of the New Testament that I did mention. Um, you've mentioned elsewhere that James and Revelation of John don't pay, present a favorable view of, of Paul, but I didn't address those books. Um, but So now I'm going to address the rest of the scriptures that did not make it into the Bible. I know you, Laverne, and you are a seeker of the true canon of God. And I'm going to tell you that not only the Old Testament canon was corrupted, but the New Testament canon as well. I know you understand that the New Testament canon is not completely preserved for us, because you accept books like Didache and the Gospel of Thomas, which I also accept as scripture. And you accept the Damascus document and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So you see, you accept these writings of the New Testament era. So I'm trying to tell you also that there are some other New Testament era writings that you are not accepting currently. Or at least you're not sure about. Or maybe you don't even know about these. So this is the video where I'm going to discuss those. And in those books of God that they, I believe are inspired scripture we see that they believe that Paul was saved throughout his entire life until the very end. And all the apostles believed that in their book. That's what they claim. Unless it's a big conspiracy, they're all liars. Then we just have to, we have to take these historical sources. And this is what they, the, these men, all these writings I'm about to quote from you, quote to you. These men all knew Paul, and they all knew the apostles, okay? So, 
who should we trust more? Like, discounting all evidence, who should we trust more? If it's just based on, on, um, on who's closest, who should we trust more? Someone from the 21st century who is so many, who is 2,000 years displaced, who's reading these pagan English translations that many times botch completely the original text and the original meaning. And often, because of that, misunderstands certain passages of scripture, if that's even a possibility, which it is a possibility, because it's been displaced, um, I like to think that you have a good understanding of scripture, but I don't think it's perfect because you are still using English translations as if they were the original. I know you don't believe that, but you're still using them. In my perspective, it seems you are still justifying certain beliefs of yours mainly from the English text. But I believe if you were to go back to the Greek and actually the original, which is Hebrew, you would see that most of these things you are finding faulty with these different uh, people and these different teachings are, are due to the translators who had the bias of doctrinal uh, evil. Remember, these the, the Bible was translated by Trinitarian uh, pagans who don't obey God's word. They do not. They they twist things, and they, when they do, when they translate, they interpret um, the way they have been told to interpret. Now, let me just clarify. When I say Trinitarian. I believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God. But not that there are three persons. They're all the same one person. So that's why I refer to Trinitarian in a negative sense. Because I believe Trini Trinity is a negative thing and it's not of God. Anyways, I just wanted to explain that. Um, so, are you going to keep trusting... Uh, are you going to be basing your doctrines off of these uh, pagan people who are not obeying God, or are you going to try to, to the best of your abilities, go back to the original source and reject all that biased filled garbage translation and to read the Word of God in a pure way? That's what we got to do. Um, anyway, I'm rambling now. So, with that said, I'm going to start. This is uh, Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome was a very important individual in the early, early church. Clement of Rome knew Paul himself and the other apostles. Um, according to this one book that I'm not sure exactly is scripture, but I'm leaning very strongly towards, Clement was converted to to the true faith by Peter. So Clement is a disciple of Peter. Now I, I take this from the, uh, the book called The Recognitions of Clement, which preserves the preaching of Peter, which is also referred to by other church fathers, like, like Clement of Alexandria, who refers to the preaching of Peter as scripture. Um, another thing, Dionysus the Areopagite also seems to refer to the recognition of Clement. As authentic. So therefore I conclude that probably the recognitions of Clement are authentic, but I'm not 100% convinced. At any rate, Clement was converted by Peter, according to that in the church tradition. So Clement was in good standing with Peter originally. Now in, um, so I'm going to read from, now Clement wrote several writings he wrote two letters, at least, to the Corinthians. Most scholars say 2 Corinthians is not authentic. Uh, that is, not written by Clement. But, however, most scholars believe that first Clement was written by Clement of Rome himself. So, we're, so that is good, because I'm going to be quoting just from 
first Clement. So the letter, the first letter of Clement of Rome, chapter 5, reads as follows. But not to dwell upon ancient examples, let us come to the most recent spiritual heroes. Let us take the noble examples furnished, furnished in our own generation. Through envy and jealousy, the greatest and most righteous pillars of the church have been persecuted and put to death. Let us set before our eyes the illustrious apostles, Peter, through unrighteous envy, endured not one or two, but numerous laborers, and when he had finally suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of glory due to him. Owing to envy, Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance, after being seven times thrown into captivity, compelled to flee and stoned. After preaching both to the, in the East and West, he gained the illustrious reputation due to his faith, having taught righteousness to the whole world and come to the extreme limit of the West and suffered martyrdom under the prefects. Thus was he removed from the world and went into the holy place, having proved himself a striking example of patience. There is no way to read what I just read from Clement of Rome and conclude that Clement believed that Paul was a false prophet ever after he became converted to the true faith. Clement just said in that passage that I read to you that throughout Paul's life he was a true follower of God. He was an illustrious apostle and the greatest he was one of the greatest and most righteous pillars of the church persecuted and put to death, and after being put to death, he went into the holy place. In other words, Clement believed he was saved, and he proved himself a striking example of patience. These words are not ever used to refer to a false prophet. Obviously here, Clement of Rome accepted Paul throughout. Now let's read chapter 47 of First Clement. Take up the epistle of the blessed Apostle Paul. What did he write to you at the time when the gospel first began to be preached? Truly under the inspiration of the Spirit, he wrote to you concerning himself, and Cephas and Apollos, because even then parties had been formed among you. You mentioned in a previous video that 1 Corinthians shows uh, Peter, uh, Paul's jealousy of Peter and things like that. But according to Clement... According to Clement, who knew Peter personally as his own spiritual teacher, he, Clement doesn't think that, certainly uh, Peter didn't think that Paul was envious. Right here, he says, everything in 1 Corinthians was under the inspiration of the Spirit. Um, and concerning himself, Cephas, and Apollos, that there were parties or factions being formed among the Corinthians wrongly. The, the way Clement refers to 1 Corinthians is just a complete endorsement of the entire thing. So we see right here that Clement of Rome approves of, of Paul and 1 Corinthians. Now, I'm going to read to you third vision of the shepherd of Hermas, for, uh, an excerpt from it says, Thou shalt therefore write two little books, and shalt send one to Clement and one to Grapte. So Clement shall send to the foreign cities, for this is his duty, while Grapte shall instruct the widows and the orphans, but thou shalt read to this city along with the elders that preside over the church. So in that passage, Hermas, after writing the book of Hermas, is commanded to give the Shepherd of Hermas, to make two copies of it, to give one to Clement of Rome to disperse to the other churches, and the other one to be given to Grapte. So here, Hermas approves of Clement of Rome as a true brother of God. Now, read Shepherd of Hermas, and you will conclude that there's no way that this man, Hermas, is a false prophet. 
everything in there is so completely righteous and it's obviously inspired there's no other way to explain its origin um now another thing in the very beginning of the shepherd of hermes rhoda it mentions rhoda and rhoda was his former slave owner remember rhoda was was mentioned in the, the acts of the apostles as a convert to true faith so then we see that rhoda appears in the sky in a vision to Hermes and rebukes Hermes for sinning. She says that God is angry against you, Hermes, for sinning against me. So Hermes had sinned against her by lusting after her when he saw, when he observed her coming out of the water naked. He watched her as she came out from her bathing and he lusted after her, which was a sin. And so God was greatly angry at that, and he, God had Rhoda rebuke him in a vision. So, right there, we see, that was before Hermes became saved, by the way. So, right there, after Hermes becomes saved, he still regards Rhoda as righteous and of the true faith, and Rhoda, before, accepted Paul, and evidently must have, still have, because... Uh, Hermes also accepted Clement, and Clement accepted Paul throughout his entire life. So, we, we see right there the connection here. Now, Romans chapter 16, verse 14, Paul says to greet Hermes. So, according to that, um, Hermes and Paul were connected, and they were regarding each other as spiritual brothers at that time in Paul's life. Now, Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, um, refers to Clement. And Paul refers to Clement of Rome. And that shows that Clem at that time, Clement of Rome and Paul regarded each other as two brothers of Christ. So right there we have Paul, Clement, and Hermas all at the same time, all believing each other to be brothers of the true faith at one time. Uh, I'm going to have to end this video and continue. Thank you and shalom. This is part eight in a series of videos in my defense of Paul. So in the, I'm just going to continue from the previous video. I was, I was interrupted by the end of it. Um, so uh, let me just quickly read Romans 16:14. It says, "Salute, Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them." So that shows Paul endorses Hermes right there. At that time in his life. Philippians chapter 4 verse 3. And I entreat thee also. True yoke fellow. Help those women. Which labored with me in the gospel. With Clement also. And with other my fellow laborers. Whose names are in the book of life. So according to this passage. Clement of Rome. His name is in the book of life. So evidently. Paul approved of Clement and Hermes in these two letters. And Paul, we can see clearly that Paul assumed that Clement and Hermes also accepted him as a true brother of Christ at that time in Paul's life. So right there we have three, the three individuals, Paul, Hermes, and Clement, all alive at the same time, and they all approve each other as true men of God. After Paul died, um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's not quite true. Sorry. Okay. So, so Clement, I was, okay, sorry. Uh, so, yes, after Paul died, Clement of Rome still regarded him as of the true faith. Now, Hermes, remember, Hermes approved of Paul. Um, so he trusted him early on. Unless Clement of Rome later on left the faith, then we have to realize that Hermes, Hermes' approval of Clement shows that Clement's testimony about Paul is trustworthy. Um, now, I'll continue. This is from Dionysius, the Areopagite. He wrote a book called The Divine Names. It, in his book of Divine Names, he talks about the different names for God and how None of those names perfectly capture who God is, because God is above 
all words that can express. So in that book of divine names, we read as follows. It says, now it may well be that Clement, a philosopher, uses the term exemplar in relation to the more important things among beings, but his discourse does not proceed according to the proper, perfect, and simple naming. So right there, Dionysius approves of Clement. He doesn't ever refer to Clement in a negative way, and so even in Dionysius' time, he approves of Clement. Another thing, it's a, um, remember I told you about the recognitions of Clement. Right there, that passage from Dionysius, I believe, is a proof that recognitions of Clement is in fact scripture, or at least written by a Clement of Rome. Uh, I'm not 100% convinced on that, but I currently believe that. So, with that said, I will continue now. Now, this is, uh, I'm going to now leave Clement of Rome, and now I'm going to come to uh, this man, this blessed man, apostle, maybe not apostle, but this blessed man of the early church known as Titus. Titus was originally a follower, a true follower of God. We can't, we won't deny that. I, I assume we both believe that Titus was a true follower of God, at least originally. But, did you know that in the so-called Apocrypha, there is a letter that was authored by Titus himself? This is often referred to as Pseudo-Titus by many scholars. But, it's not Pseudo-Titus. It's actually written by Titus. That is the best explanation for its existence. It does not read like a forgery, in my belief. So, what does Titus say in his letter? Well, his letter is about, uh, mainly about um, virgin, uh, virginity. It's about being pure and chaste. Okay? So, however, Titus is very clearly a lover of apocryphal books quote-unquote apocryphal books, because we know that they're not apocryphal, but they're actually scripture. Throughout many of, throughout Titus's writings, we see he refers to some of the Catholic apocrypha as scripture. He uses, uh, he refers to the revelation of Elijah as scripture. He quotes certain passages from some of the prophets that are just not found in the Old Testament. And... He also, inter he also accepts some of the so-called New Testament Apocrypha. For example, the Acts of Andrew he accepts as scripture. Another one is the Acts of Paul and Thecla. And also the Acts of Peter. I'm going to read this to you from the uh, letter, letter of Titus. The letter from Titus. It says, If the Apostle Paul if the Apostle Paul forbade communion to a woman caught in adulterous relation with a strange man, how much more when those concerned are saints dedicated to Christ? That passage in Titus's letter, that story is not found anywhere in the New Testament or in any other book. The only book it's found in is in the Acts of Peter. And that very story is there. It's reproduced. So evidently Titus regarded the Acts of Peter as scripture, or at least as authoritative and an accurate uh, account of what happened to Paul and Peter. So now I'm going to read one thing from the Acts of Peter, which is pretty compelling. Um, wait, now I'm gonna, let me see. Um, where is it? Um, it might be later down in my video, so I apologize. I mean, in my documents, it might be down later, so hopefully I'll find it. But for now, I'm going to move on. So he endorses the acts of Paul and Thecla, as I said. So I'm going to read from Titus' letter, which shows that he approves of the acts of Paul and Thecla. It says, And Paul, the chosen vessel of the Lord, and the impregnable wall among the Gentiles, I mean, among the disciples, admonishes us 
when in the course of his mission, the virgin Thecla, full of innocent faithfulness to Christ, wished to kiss his chain. Mark thou what the apostle said to her. Touch me not, he said, because of the frailty of this time. Thou dost see then, O young man, what the present Lord and the recorded testament of the disciple have said against the flesh. For they did not order the woman to withdraw for their own sakes, for the Lord cannot be tempted, and just as little can Paul his vicar. But these admonitions and commands were uttered for the sake of us who are now members of Christ. That right there is an uh, explicit endorsement of the story of the Acts of Paul and Thecla, which presents Paul very favorably. And also, I might have a reference later, but if so, I'll skip it because I'm going to say it now. The Acts of Paul and Thecla were written after the, the letter to the Romans. I mean, the, the events of the Acts of Paul and Thecla come after the letter to the Romans because we compare and it says... Like, Paul wrote his letter before he went to Spain. He said, I want, I really want to go to Spain. That occurred. His desire to go to Spain was around the time of Romans being written. And we know that Romans was written before he went to Spain. <laughs> but the acts of Paul and Thecla happen after... Basically, he, he desires to go to Spain and goes to Spain in the acts of Paul and Thecla. Therefore, the entire narrative comes after Romans. So, therefore, the writer of Acts of Paul and Thecla approves of Paul after Paul wrote the letter to the Romans. And Titus here evidently believes that Paul uh, was a true follower of God even after he wrote the letter to the Romans. Now, I'm going to read another thing that Titus said which is, starts quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 34. It says, Those who have not abandoned themselves to men, he calls virgins. As the Apostle of Christ says, the unmarried think day and night on godly things. To act properly, and to please him alone, and not to deny by their doings what they have promised in words. Why should a virgin who is already betrothed to Christ, be united with a carnal man. This shows Titus approved of 1 Corinthians. He's using it and still refers to him as apostle of Christ, not as a false prophet. So evidently, he accepted 1 Corinthians as authentic. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and chapter 11, we see referenced slash quoted in Titus's letter here it says, According to the teaching of the Apostle, let us not lose courage, he says, in the hardest labors, in affliction, in grief, in suffering, abuse. We suffer persecution, but we are not forsaken, because we bear in our body the possession of Christ. Wherefore, we are by no means overcome. And again, the same Apostle left an example behind him, describing his own disasters and saying, I have labored much, I have frequently been imprisoned, I have suffered extremely many floggings, I have often fallen into deadly peril of the Jews. He says, I have five times received forty stripes, save one. Three times have I been beaten with rods, once have I been stoned, thrice have I suffered shipwreck, a day and night I have spent in the depths of the sea. I have often journeyed, often been in peril of rivers, in peril of robbers, in peril among unbelievers in manifold ways, in peril among false brethren, in trouble and labor, frequently in sorrow, in many watchings, in hunger and thirst, in many fastings, in cold and nakedness, in inward anxieties, besides the cares which do not have direct reference to my personal suffering. And in all these I have not lost courage, because Christ was and still is with me. Then Titus says about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a reference, which is this. Where then art thou now, thou who hast passed the time of thy youth happily with a sinner, the apostle testifying, moreover, that neither flesh nor blood will possess the kingdom of God? Now then, Titus 
uh, uses chapter 5 of Galatians and says this. Here the apostle who says to you, see, he says, that you give not place to the flesh through the liberty of God. And again, fill not the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh hateth, uh, I mean, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are opposed to one another. Therefore he says, do not what ye would. Otherwise, the Spirit of God is not in you. Right there, Titus clearly approves of Paul, Paul's letter to Galatians. And this is that passage he quoted from Galatians. I'm sure you would agree with. That's a very good thing of Paul. Now, moving on. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a reference, is this from Titus's letter. On the unprecedented crime of the new people of this new people, the apostle says, "One hears commonly of unchastity among you, and indeed of such ch unchastity as is never met with among the Gentiles, that one lives with his father's wife, and ye are yet puffed up, and do not rather mourn that such an evil doer may be removed from your midst. I am indeed absent in the body." But in the spirit am among you, and already, as if I were present, I have passed sentence on the evil doer, to hand over that man to Satan in the name of Christ. Next is First Corinthians chapter ten. Titus says this: The apostle has already shown the future in advance, saying, "Let no temptation take hold of you." He says, "Save what is human." Then, um, you know, I'm going to save the rest for. No, I think I'm. Uh, yeah, I'll say the rest for the next video. So, anyways, uh, thank you for watching and shalom. Shalom. This is part nine in a series of videos in which I seek to defend Paul. So, continuing from the previous video, I'm reading from Titus's letter that he wrote himself. This is Second Corinthians chapter eleven, a reference to in his letter. And he says, in another passage we read, I abhor such sport, he says, unclean heresy, lust of the ascetic, bodies entwined in one another. I am ashamed to bring forward the further final doings which the enemy has instigated and to which the apostle has prudently called to our attention, saying, I am afraid concerning you lest ye be seduced by the enemy, as in those days Eve was cunningly tempted by the serpent. And then another place, Paul uh, Titus says this in his letter. He says, If the apostle allowed marriage itself to be dissolved, that it might not occasion a heaping up of offenses, what should we say of the state of the ascetic, which most of all should be free from fleshy, fleshly lust? So right there. Those are references from Titus to Paul about Paul. I mean, clearly Titus believed Paul was a true man of God for his entire life. Now, I did find the Acts of Peter reference. So this is a major amazing reference because I showed you before that Titus believes the Acts of Peter is authoritative slash scripture. So what does the Acts of Peter say? Well, Acts of Peter discusses Paul a lot. I'm not going to read all those references to Paul. How I'm going to read just one reference and this reference is the single most important reference of all the references that Titus accepts. This is what the Acts of Peter says. Remember, Titus approves of Acts of Peter as authoritative, as I showed. So this is what the Acts of Peter says. He therefore, having related to the brethren what God had commanded, nothing doubting, prepared himself to set forth from the city. But when Paul was about to depart, there was great weeping throughout all the brotherhood because they thought that they should see Paul no more, so that they even rent their clothes. For they had in mind also how that Paul had oftentimes contended with the doctors of the Jews, and confuted them, saying, Christ, upon whom your fathers laid hands, abolished their sacrifices, and fasts, and holy days, and circumcisions, and the doctrines of men, and the rest of the traditions he did abolish. But the brethren lamented and adjured Paul, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he should not be absent above a year, saying, We know thy love for thy brethren, 
forget not us when thou art come thither, neither begin to forget us as little children without a mother. <clears throat> and when they besought him long with tears, there came a sound from heaven and a great voice saying, Paul, the servant of God, is chosen to minister all the days of his life. By the hands of Nero, the ungodly and wicked man, shall he be perfected before your eyes. And a very great fear fell upon the brethren because of the voice which came from heaven, and they were confirmed yet more in the faith. Acts of Peter right there just shows that the author of the Acts of Peter believed that Paul, and that God explicitly said that Paul would be of a true faith throughout his entire life, all his days, he said, until his death, and uh, that at his death he would be perfected. In other words, he would be saved. Remember, Titus, I showed, believes Acts of Peter is scripture. And I also believe Acts of Peter is scripture. And so we see that Acts of Peter clearly teaches what I'm saying, that Paul was accepted by all the early followers of Christ as never becoming a false prophet, but always remaining in the true faith until his very death. Now, moving on, Dionysius the Areopagite approves of Titus. So we see that Dionysius approves of this man Titus, who approves of Acts of Peter, who approves, which approves of Paul. And not only this, but Titus also approves of Paul elsewhere in his writings, and so does Dionysius. But at any rate, so Dionysius approves of Titus. How do we know this? Because in his ninth letter, he specifically addresses it to Titus. So in other words, the letter of Dionysius to Titus, we have in right in pre preservation. It's come down to us. And he says the following in it. He says, My dear Titus, I do not know if the sacred Timothy, at the time he departed, was unaware of the theological symbols of which I have been offering interpretations. So right there, that shows that Titus accepts Dionysius, and Dionysius accepts Titus, and they both believe each other to be true followers of God, brothers, spiritual, in the true faith. And this was after Paul's death. So right there, Dionysius approves of Titus, and likewise, Titus approves of Dionysius. Now, remember I mentioned justice in uh, the videos of Acts of the Apostles? Justice uh, originally approved of Paul, as shown in the Acts of the Apostles. Well, here we see that justice is approved of by Dionysius. In his book of Divine Names, he says this. Now the sacred justice gives us, gives, excuse me, now the sacred justice gives to that quality of divine peace and tranquility the name of ineffable and of unmoving in terms of any known procession. Right there, Dionysus refers to an apocryphal writing that justice wrote. Apocryphal writing which is scripture, but we don't have. So unfortunately, Justice's writings are lost to us, but Dionysius accepted them as scripture, Dionysius approved of them, and not only this, Dionysius, as I said, accepts Paul and never believed him to be a false prophet, but accepted him as a true fellow of God throughout his entire life. And therefore, he also was convinced that Justice also agreed with him. Otherwise, he wouldn't approve of Justice, but he clearly does. So in, in Dionysius' mind, Justice also, throughout the rest of his life, approved of Paul. Now, uh, the divine names, uh, again, Dionysius, uh, in, the, in the divine names, it's a, this is for Timothy now. It says, uh, Timothy the elder, to, I mean, excuse me, Dionysius the elder to Timothy the fellow elder. And then he says, so, my good Timothy, you must guard these things in accordance with the divine command. Then in this book that scholars refer to as the mystical theology, or excuse me, mystical hierarchy, it says, wait, uh, no, I think it's mystical theology. Yeah, that's what the scholars refer to it as. In this book, Dionysius says, For this I pray, and Timothy, my friend, my advice to you as you look for a sight of the mysterious things. In the celestial hierarchy, hierarchy that scholars call, it says, 
it, it starts off with Dionysius the Elder to Timothy the Fellow Elder. In the ecclesiastical hierarchy that scholars call that, it says, starts off with Dionysius the Elder to Timothy the Fellow Elder. Um, also, there is one letter, um, I mean, there's run writing that isn't commonly included in the writings of Dionysius the Areopagite, and that's Dionysius's book to Timothy, in which Dionysius celebrates the martyrdoms of Paul and Peter as true men of God, um, and discusses their 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 annual celebrate the annual celebration of their martyrdom days and the martyrdom days of the other apostles. Now this is authentic historical source to what later became known to us by the Roman Catholics and the other Christians as the church tradition where they celebrated the so-called saint days. Of course, they do not keep the true calendar of God, the Enoch calendar, so they're not doing, they're not celebrating the martyrs' days of martyrdom on the correct days. Um, but they do have an authentic source that they later corrupted. So many people give these uh, Catholics too much credit. The Catholics didn't come up with these things out of, you know, randomly. They were derived from things that originally were true. Most of the Catholic things are derived from either true practices from the Essene movement or they derived from pagan doctrines. It was basically a syncretism of Essenism and paganism. And what happened was that when they came together, also Gnosticism coming in, it formed what we know today as Christianity, which teaches against so many things of God's truth. Um, especially antinomianism. Contrary to, they teach against the law of Moses and they teach against righteousness that is outside of the law of Moses as well by saying you don't have to stop sinning in order to be saved. So we see, we see the connection there though. That Dionysius does in fact prove that there is an authentic source to many of these false teachings that are later come up with by, by antinomians. Now this is the sixth letter of Dionysius the Areopagite. In the sixth letter, it, it starts off with, to the priest Sosipater. Remember, Sosipater was a man referenced in the previous videos that was approved of by Paul in one of his letters, in one of the previous videos. Um, so, then he also says, do not count it a triumph, Reverend Sosipater, that you are denouncing, denouncing a cult or point of view which does not seem to be good. And do not imagine that having thoroughly refuted it, all is therefore well with Salsipater. For it could happen that the one hidden truth could escape both of you, and others in the midst of falsehoods and appearances. What is not red does not have to be white. What is not a horse is not necessarily a human. So right there, Dionysius is trying to make sure that Salsipater is not on the wrong path. And he's saying, Salsipater your logic isn't really good. You're misunderstanding things here. Let me let me little let me show you the truth of the matter. So Dionysius, though, believes Sosipater understands that Dionysius is a prominent leader and he respects Dionysius. Dionysius shows us because otherwise he wouldn't be writing to Sosipater. Or why else would Sosipater listen to him if Dionysius wasn't valuable in the leadership at all? So clearly Sosipater approves of Dionysius at this point, and likewise Dionysius approves of Sosipater, but is trying to protect him from falsehood. Um, and also the Acts of, the Apollo, uh, Acts of Paul and Thecla teach that Onesiphorus approves of Paul all the way to the ends of Acts of Paul and Thecla. Now the teachings of Silvanus um, it says the following. This, Sylvanus is another name for Silas. Remember, we read, we read about Silas throughout all those videos. Silas was the one of the ones that wrote many of the letters, co-authored many of the letters of Paul. He was also, when when there was that big falling out, quote-unquote falling out, between 
Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas took Mark and Paul took Silas, or in other words, Paul took Silvanus. So, the teachings of Silvanus slash Silas reads as follow follows. But he who makes himself like God is one who does nothing unworthy of God, according to the statement of Paul, who has become like Christ. That refers to Silvanus' belief that Paul has become like Christ after, after dying, who has now become like Christ. Uh, so Silvanus, Silas, approves of Paul throughout his entire life. Silvanus' writings were found in the Nag Hammadi Library, otherwise known as the Gnostic Library. Don't be so quick to denounce the teachings of Silvanus as heretical, though, because, as scholars admit, there's nothing really much Gnostic at all about the teachings of Silvanus. It's actually quite orthodox, as they understand orthodoxy. It's actually quite apparently orthodox in teaching. Just like the Gospel of Thomas. Remember, the Gospel of Thomas that we both accept was found at Nag Hammadi. That's our main source of the manuscript. The rest of the manuscripts of the Gospel of Thomas are completely fragmentary and preserve very little of the Gospel of Thomas. So the teachings of Silvanus, even though they're found in a Gnostic library, are the authentic words of Silas himself and therefore are scripture because Sil Silas was a true man of God throughout his entire life. But here, Silas clearly approves of Paul throughout the entirety of Paul's life. So, that right there is another, another man approving of Paul. I'm going to end this video because I'm almost at the 15 minute mark. Thank you and shalom. This is part 10 in a series of videos in defending Paul. So, now I'm going to continue from where I left off. Now, we see that the Apostle John approved of the man, the follower of God, named Gaius in 3 John. 3 John says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Uh, also, we see Gaius approved of Paul's letter to the Romans, as Paul indicates in the letter of the Romans, that Gaius, Gaius sends greetings to Paul through the letter to the Romans. When Paul says someone sends greetings, that is Paul's way of saying they endorse this letter. So according to Paul, Gaius endorsed the letter to Romans by sending greetings through the letter to the Romans. So we can see that if you find that Romans has objectional theological truths and content in it, apparently Gaius thought otherwise. And not only that, but John the Apostle approves of Gaius. How could John the Apostle approve of Gaius, who approves of the Book of Romans, if the Book of Romans is abominable, abominable, if it's false teaching? How could John the Apostle approve of Gaius? He's his well-beloved Gaius, and he's writing to him as a brother. So, evidently here, there, it's not fitting. Uh, so now I... Now remember, 3 John was written after Paul's death. So, but Gaius, who approved of Paul's letter, and as we learn in the Acts of the Apostles, Gaius was a friend of Paul. I, I think if we, I think we learned that in the Acts of the Apostles, if I'm not mixing that up. Um, if I didn't mention that in any of the previous videos, then he didn't. So, but, um, anyways. Okay, so... Then we look at Dionysius the Areopagite, and according to and Dionysius wrote himself four letters to Dionysius himself. Um, now the translation, I'm not sure what this Greek word is. They translate it as monk. I'm not sure what that means, in what or the Greek sources. So it says, for the first letter, the first letter of Dionysius to the monk Gaius. That it's the second letter of Dionysius, the Areopagite, to the same monk, Gaius. The third letter of Dionysius to the same Gaius. And the fourth letter of Dionysius to the same monk, Gaius. So that right there shows that Dionysius, the Areopagite, and Gaius approved of each other 
as true followers of God after Paul's death. Which, and this is also at the same time, or roughly around 3rd John. So 3rd John, which means that John, Dionysius, and Gaius all approve of each other as true followers of God, and they all, um, and yeah, and they so they accept Gaius as a true follower, and that, since both since Ga, since um, Dionysius approves of Paul for his entirety of his life, which I'm going to show, that proves that Gaius also believed that, and so did John. Um, so uh, now I'll continue. Um, remember, Acts chapter 17 verse 14 reads as follows. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed among that which was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So again, this approved Luke. This shows that Luke approved of Dionysius the Areopagite, and also shows that he was a significant man and in the early church and must have been a prominent leader. And these writings show him as a prominent leader. And you would expect him to write writings like of this caliber. And so I regard them as authentic. Contrary to the scholars, but that's what I do. Because I try to be open-minded to the truth of scripture and history. And Dionysus the Areopagite, I am convinced, is God inspired in his words. That he is a true follower of God. So at any rate, now I'm going to go to Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John himself, John the Apostle. Polycarp knew John personally, was his friend, and was his apostle. This is what Polycarp says in his letter to the Philippians, chapter 3. These things, brethren, I write to you concerning righteousness, not because I take anything upon myself, but because you have invited me to do so. For neither I nor any other such one can come up to the wisdom of a blessed and glorified Paul. He went among you and accurately and steadfastly taught the word of truth in the presence of those who were then alive. And when absent from you, he wrote you a letter, which, if you carefully study, you will find to be the means of building you up in that faith which you have been given you, which has been given you and which, being followed by hope and preceded by love towards God and Christ and our neighbor, is the mother of us all. So right there, Polycarp specifically endorses everything in the letter to the Philippians and says that Paul, throughout the entirety of his life, was a true follower of God. Now, and that's Polycarp, the very dis disciple of John, teaching this. So that, how could the, the very disciple of John believe this if John believed that Paul was a false prophet. John would have told Polycarp that he was a false prophet, and yet Polycarp somehow still believes that Paul was not a false prophet. So, how could this be, unless Polycarp rebelled against his, his teacher? But we don't see any evidence for this in the history. In fact, we see the exact opposite, that Polycarp and John continued for the rest of for their entire lives as friends and regarded each other as spiritual brothers. I'll continue. Uh, chapter, this is, um, chapter, sorry, chapter 9 of Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. Um, so it reads as follows. It reads, I exhort you all, therefore, to yield obedience to the word of righteousness, and to exercise all patience, since as ye, such as ye have seen set before your eyes, not only in the case of the blessed Ignatius and Zosimus and Rufus, but also in the uh, in others among yourselves, and in Paul himself, and the rest of the apostles. In the assurance that all these have not run in vain, but in faith and righteousness, and that they are now in their due place in the presence of the Lord, with him, with whom also they suffered. For they loved not this present world, but him who died for us and for our sakes was raised again by God from the dead. So, Paul, 
I mean, excuse me, Polycarp approves of Ignatius, Zosimus, Rufus, and Paul. And in addition, Paul, he says, did not run in vain, but in faith and righteousness, and that they are in due place in the presence of the Lord, with whom they also suffered martyrdom. For they did not love this present world, but they loved him who died for us, for our sakes, was raised again by God from the dead. The Polycarp clearly approves of Paul for the entirety of his life. Not only this, but he also approves of Ignatius, Zosimus, and Rufus. Rufus, as I showed before in the Acts of the Apostles, was a prominent individual. But Rufus, here, Polycarp understands, is in agreement with Polycarp. Otherwise, Polycarp would not um, refer to Rufus as a righteous person if he was um, referring to Paul as a false prophet later on in his life. So the fact that he, the fact to hear that Polycarp endorses Rufus and whom Polycarp knew Rufus personally, thus shows that Polycarp and Rufus were of the same mind in regards to who Paul was, and that was that he was a true follower of God for his entire life. Same thing about Zosimus, and same thing about Ignatius. A little bit later, I'm going to show you the writings of Ignatius himself, which prove that they, they are the single most greatest proof, the Ignatius writings, that Paul never was a false prophet, according to the apostles, but that he remained in the truth, and that all the followers of God in the first century that knew Paul and knew the apostles believed that Paul was the true faith always throughout his entire life. So, now, also in chapter 11 of Polycarp, it says this, But who of us are ignorant of the judgment of the Lord? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, as Paul teaches? But I have neither seen nor heard of any such thing among you, in the midst of whom the blessed Paul labored, and who are commended in the beginning of his epistle. For he boasts of you all in those churches which alone then knew the Lord. But we of Smyrna had not yet known him. Now, Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. So that's what he means. That's what he means. Um, okay, so then um, Dionysius, the Areopagite, as I told you before, approves of Paul. In addition, he writes a letter specifically to Polycarp. It says, to Polycarp, a hierarch. Hierarch is another name for bishop. Okay, so according to Dionysius, Polycarp was his spiritual brother, and he they they wrote each other as fellow leaders and exhorted each other, and they talked as brothers. If you just read Dionysius' writing, his letter to Polycarp, you'll see that this was a letter to a man that he believed was his brother in Christ, and yet Polycarp and Dionysius both believed that Paul was always saved throughout his entire life. This is Polycarp to the Philippians, chapter 13. Both you and Ignatius wrote to me that if anyone went into Syria, he should carry your letter with him, which request I will attend to if I find a fitting opportunity, which personally or through some other acting for me that your desire may be fulfilled. The epistles of Ignatius were written by him to us, and all the rest of his epistles which we have by us, we have sent to you as you requested. They are subjoined to this epistle, and by them you may be greatly profited, for they treat of faith and patience in all things that tend to edification in our Lord. Any more information that you may have obtained respecting both Ignatius himself and those that were with him, have the goodness to make known to us. That's Polycarp specifically endorsing the letters of Ignatius as authentic words of God, authoritative and that Ignatius is a man of God approved so right there yeah that's Polycarp approving of Ignatius now I'm going to read from this is the one historical reference I mentioned to you Laverne that uh, I do not accept the scripture this is from the man known as Irenaeus he is a church father Irenaeus of, Lo of Lyons now this is one of the fragments of the lost writings of Irenaeus but it was preserved by one of the other church fathers. Oh no, it might have been in a manuscript. I can't remember. 
It was either in a manuscript or in one of the church fathers. But anyway, it's a law. It's from one of the lost writings of Irenaeus, the church father, and it says as follows: For while I was yet a boy, I saw thee in Lower Asia with Polycarp, distinguishing thyself in the royal court and endeavoring to gain his approbation. For I have a more vivid recollection of what occurred at that time than of recent events, inasmuch as the experience of childhood keeping pace with the growth of the soul became incorporated with it, so that I can even describe the place where the blessed Polycarp uh, used to sit in discourse, his going out to and his coming in, his general mode of life and personal appearance, together with the discourses which he delivered to the people, also how he would speak of his familiar intercourse with John and with the rest of those who had seen the Lord, and how he would call their words to remembrance. Whatsoever things he had heard from them respecting the Lord, both with regard to his miracles and his teaching, Polycarp, having thus received from the eyewitnesses of the word of life, would recount them all in harmony with the scriptures. These things, through God's mercy, which was upon me, I then listened to attentively and treasured them up, not on paper, but in my heart, and I am continually, by God's grace, revolving these things accurately in my mind. And I can bear witness before God that if that blessed and apostolical presbyter had heard any such thing, he would have cried out and stopped his ears, explaining, uh, exclaiming, as he was wont to do, O good God, for what times hast thou reserved me that I should endure these things? And he would have fled from the very spot where, sitting or standing, he had heard such words. This fact, too, can be made clear from his epistles, which he dispatched, whether to the neighboring churches, to confirm them. I'll continue in the next video. Alright, this is, um, I think, part 11 now, of my series of Defending Paul. And, uh, in the previous video, I didn't get to finish a quotation from the Church Father Irenaeus, so I'm going to finish it here. I'm going to start over a little bit, not completely, but just right near the end, I'm going to reread a sentence It says, this fact, too, can be made clear from his epistles, which he dispatched, whether to the neighboring churches to confirm them, or to certain of the brethren, admonishing and exhorting them. So right there we see Irenaeus, the church father. Um, he himself, uh, as a very young child, witnessed some of the sermons of Polycarp. Just like, uh, you know how there's all these major televangelists on TV? And how we, you know, we witness their sermons, but we don't actually know who they are. We don't, I mean, we don't know them personally, but we know about them. And we've heard their sermons. In the same way, Irenaeus did not know Polycarp personally, but Irenaeus knew about Polycarp and heard his sermons as a young boy, as a young little child. And he remembers specifically Polycarp saying that he himself knew the apostles, the very men that knew God, the Messiah himself, and he conversed with them, those apostles, and they told him everything that was in harmony with the scriptures and respecting, uh, respecting what the, the Messiah had done and said. So that's right there. That is evidence. That's proof that Polycarp knew the apostles themselves. He was alive during that time. He was their disciples. He was one of their disciples, that is, and he knew what the disciples taught. So either Polycarp intentionally rebelled against them, or he accurately preserved their teachings. And I contend he accurately preserved their teachings. Unfortunately, Irenaeus was a Gnostic, essentially. He'll deny that, but he was, and he was one of the main people behind what we now know today as Christianity, antinomian Christianity, that is. Uh, so, er, yeah, Irenaeus was not a good guy, but he is a historical source, because Irenaeus was sincere, and was not intentionally trying to deceive anyone, but he thought he was correct. So, at any rate, Irenaeus shows that Polycarp knew the apostles himself, that they were friends, and regarded each other as spiritual brothers. Now, with that said, as I told you before, um... Polycarp, as I read from Polycarp's letter, Polycarp clearly approves of Ignatius' letter, letters. Now, I'm going to let you know something in advance. 
the scholars reject eight of Ignatius's letters. They also absurdly believe that the what they call there's three recensions of uh, Ignatius's letters. There's the short recension, which is only three letters, which are very short versions, and there's the middle recension, uh, which is only Actually, the middle recension is all 15 as well. But seven of those letters are in a shorter form than elsewhere found. And then in the long recension, the eight letters are the same as the middle recension, but the seven letters of the middle recension that were shorter, the long recension is much longer. When you compare them, it's much longer. At least twice as much if I have estimated correctly. So, the scholars say that the, the middle recension is the authentic one, the original one, and the long recension is interpolated with tons of additions, but read, just read and study the comparison between the middle recension and the long recension. And when you do that with an open mind, there's no way to conclude that the long recension is derived from the middle recension, but that the middle recension has to be derived from the long recension. There's no way to get the middle and end up with the long. It's just absurd. There would have to be so much that the scribe added it was intentionally altering it. It comes to a point when you try to claim that someone added so much to a text, suddenly so much has been added, it's no longer the same text. It's a completely new book that they just wrote. There would be no motivation to write a whole entire new book. Their point was to accurately preserve Ignatius's writings. No one would add something so much like that to make a whole new book, completely contrary to the original. So I believe if you're open-minded and compare the middle recension to the long, you will see that the long is in fact authentic. Not only this, but except in the short recension manuscripts of Ignatius, which only have three letters of Ignatius, uh, and which almost no scholars accept as the original, and the church fathers also show that there are other letters, so uh, letters that were authentic. This indicates that uh, also in the every other manuscript other than the short recension manuscripts. All those manuscripts contain all 15 letters, and yet scholars reject eight of those 15 letters as inauthentic. They do this for their various biases by saying, oh, well, those beliefs were not historically accurate. They refer to that as anachronistic, but that's their bias. That's their throwing in. How do they know what's anachronistic? They're just scholars who don't have any clue about pretty much anything in the world. They conclude things mainly so that they can reject God's word and righteousness. They don't want to follow the true religion. They're trying to explain away the origin of Christianity, the true faith of Christianity, that is. They're trying to explain the origins of so many things, and, and they try to explain away all the prophecies of God. But so, at any rate, while the scholars will say that Ignatius' writings are on, the only authentic ones are the seven letters in the middle recension. The quotations I'm going to quote to you are from the long recension of the seven letters and the also the eight extra letters I'll be referencing as well. But I urge you to consider that the all that what I'm using is the actual authentic. If you just research it and study it yourself you'll see that there's no other way. There's no denying it. These Eight let these all fifteen letters are authentic, and the long recension is indeed authentic. With that said, allow me to start reading Ignatius's writings. This is from the letter of Ignatius to the Ephesians. It says, "I have therefore received your whole multitude in the name of God through Onesimus, a man of inexpressible love, who is your bishop, whom I pray you by." Jesus Christ to love, that ye would all seek to be like him. Um, uh, chapter 2, together with Onesimus, I'm sorry, another place in 
Ephesians, it says, together with Lysimus and Burrus and Nublus and Fronto, by means of whom I have I have as to love beheld all of you. Right there, Ignatius shows that he believes that Lysimus currently is a fellow spiritual brother, and that Burrus, Euplus, and Fro Fronto are also spiritual brothers of all the true faith. Now remember, Onesimus is the man uh, that Paul advocated for. Later on, Onesimus, if I remember correctly, endorsed some of Paul's letters that were sort of controversial. Um, so Onesimus, according to Paul, still approved of Paul even during his controversial days in some of his controversial letters. Later on in the letter to the Ephesians, he says, this is Ignatius, it says, Wherefore, it behooves us also to live according to the will of God in Christ, and to imitate him as Paul did. For, says he, that is Paul, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That's a reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Right there, Ignatius is approving of Paul throughout the entirety of his life. Next, chapter 6 of uh, Ephesians. It says, And ye are, as Paul wrote to you, one body and one spirit, because ye have also been called in one hope to the faith, of the faith. Since also there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father over all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Such, then, are you having been taught by such instructors, structures, Paul the Christ-bearer, and Timothy the most faithful. Remember I showed you that Timothy and Dionysius approved of each other, right? Well here, Ignatius calls Timothy the most faithful, and calls Paul the Christ-bearer. Not Paul the wolf in sheep's clothing, and not Timothy the... Uh, devil's advocate. They're both regarded as Ignatius as true men of God, even at this point. Later on in a letter to the Ephesians, he says, Wherefore Paul exhorts as follows, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle towards all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Do not seek to avenge yourselves on those that injure you, for says, if I have returned evil to those who return evil to me. Later on in Ephesians, it says, Ignatius says, May I attain to those, to this, so that I may be found in the lot of the Christians of Ephesus, who have always had intercourse with the apostles by the power of Jesus Christ, with Paul and John and Timothy the most faithful. Right there, he's referring. You're referring to Paul on the same level as John, Paul, um, as John and Timothy. So clearly, he believed that they're all spiritual brothers to the very end of Paul's life. Later on in Ephesians, we read, "Ye are initiated into." This is Ephesians from Ignatius. That is Ignatius to Ephesians. Ye are, ye are initiated into the mysteries of the gospel with Paul, the holy, the martyred inasmuch as he was a chosen vessel, at whose feet may I be found, and the feet of the rest of the saints, when I shall attain to Jesus Christ, who is always mindful of you in his prayers. Chapter, the, ne the next part of it, um, Ignatius' letter to the Ephesians says, Wherefore none of the devices of the devil shall be hidden from you, if, like Paul, ye perfectly possess that faith and love towards Christ, which are the beginning and the end of love. Next in Ephesians, it says, Let Christ speak in us, even as he did in Paul. So right there, the letter to the Ephesians, that right there alone is sufficient to prove that Ignatius accepted Paul. But that's only one of Paul's letters. Remember, there's 15 letters. So with that, I continue. This is Ignatius' letter to the Magnesians. There was a place called Magnesia, just like Ephesus to Ephesians is Ephesus, Magnesians is Magnesia. So, in Magnesians, it, we read this. This was first fulfilled in Syria 
for the disciples were called Christians at Antioch when Paul and Peter were laying the foundations of the church. Next, later on in Magnesians, it says this, The Ephesians from Smyrna, whence I also write to you, who are here for the glory of God, as ye also are, who have in all things refreshed me, salute you as does also Polycarp. Uh, so right there, he approves of, of Polycarp. Remember, I showed that Polycarp approved of Ignatius, so now we see here, Ignatius approves of Polycarp. Okay, and Polycarp approved of Paul. So Ignatius approves of Polycarp, and Polycarp approves of Paul, therefore Ignatius approves of Paul indirectly through Polycarp. So that's even more evidence. Now Ignatius to the Trailians. There was uh, a place called Trails, and this is Trail to the Trailians. It says this. It says, And what are the deacons but imitators of the angelic powers, fulfilling a pure and blameless ministry unto him, as the holy Stephen did to the blessed James, Timothy and Linus to Paul, and Anacletus and Clement to Peter? Ignatius says right here in this passage that Clement fulfilled a pure and blameless ministry to Peter, and Timothy fulfilled a pure and blameless ministry to Paul. This would also indicate that Paul has a pure and faithful ministry, and so was Peter and James. So we see right there that these letters of Ignatius are proving that Ignatius accepted Paul for the entirety of his life. Now I'm going to end this video and continue. Thank you. Shalom. Shalom. This is my, uh, I think this is my 12th video in defending Paul. I've lost count now, but at any rate, I'll continue. So we just left off from Ignatius' letter to the Trillians. Now here is Ignatius' letter to the Romans. I do not, as Peter and Paul, issue commandments unto you. They were apostles of Jesus Christ. But I am the very least. They were free as this servant of God, while I am even until now a servant. So I hear many people like accuse Paul of you know, boasting himself and being full of himself. Well here Ignatius is very lowly of himself and yet approves of Paul. This says something as a statement to maybe this maybe we misunderstand Paul. Ignatius, a very meek and humble man, approves of Paul. Next we shall continue. Ignatius to the Philadelphians. There was a place called Philadelphia. Not Philippians, but Philadelphia. Okay, so it says, May I have pleasure in your purity as that of Elijah, uh, or as of Joshua the son of Nun, as of Melchizedek, or as of Elisha, as of Jeremiah, or as of John the Baptist, as of the beloved disciple, as of Timothy, as of Titus, as of Evodius, as of Clement, who departed this life in chastity. Now what that means is they did not marry, they did not have sex with anyone after they became saved. However, we continue reading Ignatius' letter to the Philadelphians. Not whoever, not however, that I blame the other blessed because they entered into the married state of which I have just spoken. For I pray that being found worthy of God, I may be found at their feet in the kingdom as at the feet of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, as of Joseph and Isaiah and the rest of the prophets, as of Peter and Paul and the rest of the apostles that were married men. For they entered into these marriages not for the sake of appetite, but out of regard for the provocation of mankind. So right here, you know, many people say that Paul was not married, but this is a lie. Ignatius, a first century source who knew Paul himself, says he was married. Not only this, but in the letter of 1 Corinthians, Paul specifically mentions his marrying to someone. And he says, uh, Why then, if Peter is married, do you criticize me? Um, which is the basic gist of it. Um, I'm going to search for this. Uh, one moment. I'm going to search for this in um, in my 
one of my other tabs. So, um, let's see here. Sorry for a moment. I'm going to BibleGateway.com and doing the search. Okay, so First Corinthians. I'm going to search First Corinthians chapter four through nine, chapters four through nine, and married. Okay. Um. Sorry about this. Let's see here. Okay. Here we go. Here we are. Ready for this? It's First Corinthians chapter nine. It reads as follows. Um. Am. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas, have, ne have, have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charters? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law also, the same also? For it is written, and it keeps going. But the point is, um, so then, and then later on, verse 12, it says, If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Um... Okay, sorry, I shouldn't have read that. It's not, it's not relevant. Anyways, the point is, Paul said, verse 5, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? He is clearly defending himself here in my belief that he is about to marry someone. That's my understanding. Of that so right there we see we do see some evidence for, for for this belief of Ignatius that Paul was indeed married to a woman with that said I will continue okay so then Ignatius says in that same passage he says for they also including Paul entered into these marriages not for the sake of appetite but out of regard for the propagation of mankind so that's why Paul entered marriage, because he wanted to create children. Not so much create as birth children, that's what I mean. Now later on in the same letter to the Philadelphians, we read this from Ignatius. It says, But the Spirit made an announcement to me, saying as follows, Do nothing without the bishop. Keep your bodies as the temples of God. Love unity. Avoid divisions. Be ye followers of Paul, and of the rest of the apostles, even as they also were of Christ. Right there, that's an explicit approval of Paul. Next, Ignatius to the Smyrnaeans, from Smyrna. Ye have done well in receiving Philo and Gaius. Remember Gaius I told you about before? Gaius, um, Dionysius, and John. Well, now we have another witness, to Ignatius. So, well in receiving Philo and Gaius and Agathopus, who being the servants of Christ have followed me for the sake of God, and who greatly bless the Lord in your behalf because ye have in every way refreshed them. Oh, also, remember I mentioned Clement was um, unmarried? That's Clement of Rome. So right there Ignatius is approving of Clement of Rome. And I showed in the previous videos that Clement of Rome approved of Paul for the entirety of his life. Uh, now, 
in the same letter, read later on, it says, I salute your most worthy Bishop Polycarp and your venerable presbytery and your Christ bearing deacons, my fellow servants, and all of you individually, as generally in the name of Christ Jesus and in his flesh and blood and his passion and resurrection being in, being corporeal and spiritual in union with God and you. Also, Ignatius writes an entire letter specifically to Polycarp, indicating that Polycarp and Ignatius believed each other to be brothers. Otherwise, Polycarp would not have accepted his letter, would not have cared what Ignatius said, and Ignatius would not have cared to write to Polycarp as if he was his brother. So the writing of Ignatius to Polycarp shows that they regard each other as true, the same followers of God in the same faith. Now, Ignatius to the Tarsians, we read this. For ye are fellow citizens as well as the disciples of Paul, who fully preached the gospel from Jerusalem and ran about unto Illyricum and bear about the marks of Christ in the flesh, in his flesh. Mindful of him, do ye by all means know that Jesus the Lord was truly born of Mary, being made of a woman, and was uh, truly crucified. For says he, God forbid that I should glory stand in the cross of the Lord Jesus. And he really suffered and died and rose again. For says, if Christ should become possible, and should be the first to rise again from the dead. And again, in that he liveth, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Otherwise, what advantage would there be in bonds if Christ had not has not died? What advantage in patience? What, what advantage in stripes? Why such facts as the following? Peter was crucified. Paul and James were slain with the sword. John was banished to Patmos. Stephen was stoned to death by the Jews who killed the Lord. But none of these sufferings were in vain. For the Lord really was crucified by the ungodly. So right there, he just says that Paul's suffering was not in vain. It would have been in vain if Paul, if Paul was unsaved and a false prophet. But it was not. He was not a false prophet according to Ignatius here. Because his suffering was not in vain. But was founded on Christ's sacrifice. Because of Christ's sacrifice, Paul's suffering was not in vain. His martyrdom was not in vain, according to Ignatius. That's significant proof, right there, of Ignatius' belief. Further on, Ignatius to the Antiochians, who were from Antioch, it says, Ye have been the disciples of Paul and Peter. Do not lose what was committed to your trust. Later on in that letter, he says, Keep in remembrance Iodius, your deservedly blessed pastor, into whose hands the government over you was first entrusted by the apostles. In the other writings of the New Testament, we see, especially in Acts of the Apostles and in some of Paul's writings, that Euodius at one time believed Paul was a true follower of God, and he was a true follower of God at one point as well. But so now Ignatius shows that Euodius is still a true follower of God. Since Ignatius believes that Paul is a true follower of God always, and also believes the same about Iodius, that means that Iodius must have also accepted Paul as a true follower of God. Next, from that same letter, I salute Cassian and his partner in life, uh, and uh, their very dear children. Polycarp, that most worthy bishop, who is also deeply interested in you, salutes you, and to him I have commended, commended you in the Lord. Onesimus, the bishop of the Ephesians, salutes you, Damus, the bishop of Magnesia, salutes you. Onesimus and Damus were both individuals in the New Testament in the book of Acts who were approved of by God, at least originally. But here Ignatius says that they're still approved by God. And therefore, he, since Ignatius approves of Paul, he evidently believes that Onesimus and Damus and Polycarp and Cassian all also agree with him that Paul was a true follower of God always. Now, Ignatius to the Philippians, he says, I salute the holy bishop Polycarp. That's another testament to Ignatius approving of Polycarp. Um, now here's Ignatius to Mary at Neapolis. Now it occurs to me to mention that the report is true which I heard of thee, whilst thou wast at Rome. 
with the blessed father Linus, whom the deservedly blessed Clement, um, the hearer of Paul and Peter, has now succeeded. So Ignatius is here approving of Clement, specifically Clement of Rome. So again, that's another justification because Clement of Rome, as I showed before, approved of Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, the first one. Um, I'm going to finish this video. The good news is, I want to finish this video here about what the good news is. Next video hopefully will be the last one for a while in the sense that it will be concluded in my series, but I might add some videos later which will discuss various so-called doctrines that Paul teaches are false and addressing the teachings of Paul and showing that Paul's teachings were are in accordance with scripture. But anyways, now um, I'm going to leave it at that and I hope you enjoy it and one more video for this segment hopefully just one and thank you and shalom shalom this is in a yahoo this is part 13 in my series of videos independent paul this should be the last in this segment of defending paul in that my entire point is to reach this final video but I might make some more videos as I'll explain at the end. You'll see. Anyways, so I'll continue. Now, Ignatius, some of, you know, I mentioned 15 letters of Ignatius. Two of those letters, one is a letter to the Virgin Mary, and another is a letter from the Virgin Mary to Ignatius. That right there, I regard those as authentic letters. They read no differently than like third John. And 3rd John has very little uh, historical evidence for it to show that it was definitely written by John. But uh, for me, I accept everything as scripture unless there's a sufficient reason to doubt it. So I see here that Ignatius claims to write to Mary and that someone named who claims to be Mary writes to Ignatius. So therefore I accept it. And until someone can show me that there's not a good reason to believe that, I'm going to continue accepting that, and I think you should too. So, right here, remember I showed at the very beginning of Acts, at the very beginning of this entire video series, the Virgin Mary was prominent in the ministry. And here we see the Virgin Mary still alive and um, communicating with Ignatius. She approves of Ignatius, believes Ignatius is a true follower of God, and she herself thinks she's a true follower of God. Now, do we really think Mary, the very mother of God, uh, that she left the faith? I mean, it's always possible, but do we really think that? I don't think so. But so she knew what the true faith was, and she knew what Ignatius taught, that, she, that Ignatius truly believed that Paul was always saved. And yet Mary didn't condemn Ignatius, but she approved of Ignatius by writing to him and Reading him in such kind and warm words. Therefore, that shows that Mary also believed that Paul was always saved. Because otherwise, if they didn't agree with this, they would not have been, been so kind to each other. They would not have approved of each other as a, members of the same faith. Anyone who accepts a false prophet is not of God. So clearly, the Virgin Mary does not believe Ignatius is a, is a led astray but it is of the true faith. Also, this is the most significant thing. Ignatius wrote two letters to the Apostle John. When you read the two letters, it's evident that Ignatius and John believed that they were both of the same one faith. Now, evidently, John must have known the other teachings of Ignatius. Ignatius clearly taught, as I showed, that Paul was a true follower of God for his entire life, even until his very death, and that he never became a false prophet, never a wolf in sheep's clothing. And so Ignatius here, this shows that John was in agreement with him, otherwise they wouldn't have been so kind to each other and wrote to each other as brothers. So since Ignatius and John write to each other as brothers, this proves that John approves of Ignatius and what he teaches, and Ignatius teaches that Paul 
was never unsaved after he became saved. And therefore, John must agree with this. Otherwise, John is a liar and a deceiver. Now, I'm going to continue. Dionysius the Areopagite approves of Ignatius by saying this in his book of divine names. It says this, The divine Ignatius writes, He for whom I yearn has been crucified. So right there, that's a quotation from one of Ignatius's letters. That's Dionysius the Areopagite, once again, showing approval of Ignatius. Now, this is Dionysius's tenth letter, and he writes this to John, the Apostle John. He's writing this to John. It says this, to John the theologian, apostle, and evangelist, and exile on the island of Patmos. Later on it says, and so far as I am concerned, no one can take away the ever-shining ray of John, and as at present I am remembering and renewing the truth of your theological teaching. Later on he says, I am completely worthy of being believed when I teach and speak the things made known about you by God. Namely, that you will be released from your prison on Patmos, that you will return to the land of Asia, where you will continue to act in imitation of God, and will hand on your legacy to those who come after you. That's a very significant letter. Dionysius, which I showed, proved so many other people. Here, we see that John, the Apostle, and Dionysius, the Areopagite, both accept each other as true followers of God, as brothers in Christ. Therefore, once again, Dionysius believed that the Apostle Paul was always saved, and therefore, since John wouldn't have accepted anything from Dionysius had he believed otherwise, he did accept it from Dionysius, and they approved of each other as, as brothers. And as I read, it said, um, he's continually renewing himself in the truth of John the Apostle's teaching. If he was doing that, then he could no way possibly come to the conclusion that Paul was a true man of God throughout his life. And yet, that's exactly what Dionysius did. So that right there is pretty conclusive evidence, in my opinion. Oh. Next, this is from the fifth letter of Dionysius. It says this. It is in this sense that one says of the divine Paul that he knew God, for he knew that God is beyond every act of mind and every way of knowing. This is from the ninth letter of Dionysius. It says, It is in this way that Paul himself, a recipient of wisdom, impaired truly spiritual knowledge. Also in that same letter, I think that was written uh, to uh, some monk or something, but basically he also quotes Carpus, the words of Carpus, a true follower of God, his brother, he says in the very text, and Carpus was mentioned in the New Testament as a true follower of God as well. So you see, Dionysius proves so much. He's a t historical testimony to all these individuals that they remained true to the faith and that they all accepted Paul throughout his, Paul's entire life. Divine Names also says this, and it would have been quite an injustice to my teacher and friend if I were to put forward as my own, the renown and contemplation and revelation of someone who next to the divine Paul has been my exemplary, uh, has been my elementary instructor. This is why the great Paul, swept along by his yearning for God and seized of its ecstatic power, had this inspired word to say, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That was from Galatians, so he refers to Galatians as inspired. Then it says, Paul is truly a lover. And as he says, he was beside himself for God. That's from 2 Corinthians 5.13. And it says, possessing not his own life, but the life of the one for whom he yearned as exceptionally beloved. This is something which was marvelously grasped by that truly divine man, my teacher and yours, and the light of our common instructor. For this is what he said, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. These words are true. And then finally, throughout Dionysius' writings, you'll find tons of allusions to Paul's writings. So, I finished with all the writings of the people that have survived, which explicitly support Paul and, believe, and teach that Paul was 
always a follower of God to the very end. With all this evidence, all this historical evidence, I showed you that all the apostles, I proved here historically and scripturally that all the apostles to the very end of the first century, they all agreed that Paul was never a false prophet after he converted to the true faith in, as described in Acts chapter 9. He never left the faith. He was never. He never became a false prophet. He remained in the true faith to the very end. That's the universal consensus in every single one of these writings. You don't find a single negative reference to Paul. You might find something that you feel is a teaching against is teaching against one of Paul's teachings, but you'll never find a reference that portrays Paul himself in a negative way in any of these writings. And these writings also show that the apostles themselves, John and Peter specifically, approved of Paul to the very end. Paul and I mean, John and Peter, these are two most important, one of the most important men in the early church, and yet they approved of Paul. So now, with that said, with all that shown, did I prove to you that Paul is not a false prophet? No, I did not do that. That was not what this series is about yet. The point of all this was to suggest to you that while it's still possible that Paul was a false prophet, in order for that to be true, all these men have, would have had to have been deceived and not followers of God. Because if they were truly followers of God, they would have recognized the false prophet. For as the Messiah says, the, the people of the faith will recognize false prophets because by their by their fruits you shall know the false prophets. That's a paraphrase from like Matthew, I think it is. So, remember remember what Second Peter says. He and, and Peter says in Second Peter it says, uh, Paul writes the same thing in his letters, but his letters are hard to understand, and ignorant and unstable people twist Paul's words to their own destruction like they do with the rest of the scriptures. So you see here that Peter says Paul's words are hard to understand. So isn't it possible that since we also we see that all the early followers of Christ that knew Paul and that knew the apostles and the apostles themselves, all of them without exception, approved of Paul to the very end and never once recanted and never call him a false prophet, but agreed that he was faithful to the very end. And we see that Second Peter says some of, writing, some of Paul's writings are hard to understand, which some people twist to teach false things uh, that Paul wasn't actually meaning. Isn't it conceivable, then, that perhaps you are misunderstanding Paul's writings because they're hard to understand? And not only that, because I do believe you're a smart man, not only because you are misunderstanding Paul, but because you're being led astray by the, these horrible translators who do not actually translate God's word. They corrupt it. They botch it completely. The Hebrew originals are the pure word of God. The English translations are, at best, um, mud. At best, miry clay that should actually have very little value to us. It's important because some of God's word is preserved to us through these translations, but a lot of it is lost to us. So much of God's word is lost through these disgusting translations that we have. And so many of your beliefs are founded upon horrible translations, and also you have been raised with um, Christian t theological terms and connotation, language connotations. I know you know what connotations means, and connotations refers to uh, something that is negatively perceived, which doesn't necessarily mean, which that word actually doesn't necessarily mean that negative connotation, and yet since it's used so often for a negative connotation, it has come to mean to be understood to refer only to that negative thing. But we can't do that. We have to look at what the actual meaning is of, of these words. So, 
I contend to you that since you are not reading the original Hebrew, unless I misunderstand, and since you're reading English translation of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, how can you be so sure that Paul is a false prophet when you are relying on antinomian pagans who corrupted God's word? How can you do that? I believe every single thing that you find wrong with Paul, I can show you that it's nothing wrong at all, but it's just a misunderstanding mainly due to the horrible translators and not to your um, unintelligence, just mainly due to your relying on horrible translations. So I want you to consider the possibility that Laverne um, I might make future videos in this series uh, addressing some of Paul's teachings that you, that you and others don't agree with. And I'll show you, through making it go back to the original Hebrew, how it is not evil teachings but in sync with God's word. Thank you and Shalom. Shalom, this is Anayahu. Uh, this is my video in which I hope to... Uh, show you, Laverne, my understanding of the letter of, of Paul to Philemon. Now, I understand that you and I don't see eye to eye in regards to Paul. You cite many different things that Paul says which you find in contradiction to the truth or what you feel, Paul, what you believe Paul is saying which is indeed contrary to the truth, if that is what Paul is saying. Um, I just want to show you that many of those things are not what actually Paul is saying, in my belief. But I, I read these passages differently than you do. Now, since I respect you as a seeker of truth, and I believe that you also respect me in that same vein, that you would be blessed, or at least this would be a helpful thing and not a waste of your time, to see how I understand it. Even if you disagree, to understand my perspective and to see... Because if you are correct and you see what my perspective is, that can help you sharpen your perspective to refute things, people, things that people say similar to me. But if I'm correct, then I can show you how you're misunderstanding, and then you can accept Paul. If I were to show you in other errors, in other things that you reject of Paul, that you're also misunderstanding those things, and eventually I would hope to show you that Paul is a true follower of God and that you would accept that. But that, I don't expect to happen overnight. This is something that's very deep and hardcore to this issue. I mean, to you know, so many things. So, I understand how important this, all this is. And that's why I'm taking so much time into addressing this. Because it's so wide-reaching. So far-reaching. There's so many letters of Paul. And so many people depend on Paul. Many people are put off by you when you reject Paul. Now, I say this not to prove that you're wrong in rejecting Paul. My point is, if Paul is indeed a true man of God, then we are needlessly, unnecessarily pushing people away that we could have otherwise possibly reached and brought to the truth. Now, all those people who turn away because you, you reject Paul, those people, it's their own fault for denying God and keep continuing in their rebellion against him. But, despite all that, we have to, to do everything in our power to help people come to the truth, to find the true gospel, and to accept it. And so any obstacles that are in the way, that are unnecessary obstacles, we should do everything in our power to remove those obstacles. So if Paul is indeed a false prophet, as you say, then yes, we must reject him even if so many people get 
put off by our message because truth is more important than vanity because vanity doesn't get you anything if it did then maybe we could be doing some lying but lying has no purpose and it won't save anyone and in fact lying condemns us to hell so so we need to seek the truth and I agree with your boldness in trying to defend what you believe. That, that is a good, admirable trait that few we find few and far between in individuals. Um, but if Paul is, is indeed a true man of God and never became a false prophet or a false apostle, false teacher, whatever you want to say, then I feel that we need to embrace Paul for the good of for the greater good of mankind and the greater good of the rest of creation because when when mankind sins we affect the rest of creation too so this is for not just us humans but for the entire world what we do affects them what we choose to believe has a major impact on this world with that said now let me actually get to the commentary on Philemon so, we start off with, this is not just Paul writing to Philemon. According to verse 1, uh, he write, uh, it says that Paul and Timothy are writing this letter. Now, apparently, Paul is still in prison. This prison is probably referring to the one very near the end of the Acts of the Apostles, when he was... Um, on, en route to uh, Caesar, to his appeal to Caesar. So right now we see Timothy approves of Paul because he's co-authoring co the letter to Philemon. So next uh, it says, um, so Paul's writing this to Philemon, our beloved. So Paul accepts Philemon as a brother and believes that Philemon will accept what he has to say. Also, to the beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. So, there was a church. Philemon and the re those people I mentioned had a church in their house. Um, and so Paul's, how Paul wrote letters to the churches in the other places. He also did that here with Philemon's church. So as you, we agree on that. I. Before before you told me about that, I never knew that because I didn't really read Philemon all the way through. So that is that detailed as you did, but after you mentioned that, I read it and I'm like, wow, yeah, he's right. So Philemon was written by Paul to the church of Philemon, not just the man Philemon. So that's something significant we often don't realize because we just don't study the scripture. That is a, a, a common trait of Protestants who don't really study the scriptures truthfully. They just kind of listen to what their teachers say or they choose to study the scriptures that they want to choose to, to study and ignore many of the details. But so anyways, I, so I thank you for showing me that. Anyways, next, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, an appropriate opening statement so then he says I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers there he establishes his personal connection with Philemon and their close spiritual brotherhood so he says I mention you always in my prayers and hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and towards all the Saints that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing um, which is in us, which is in us, in Christ Jesus. For, for, we, uh, for we had great, we had great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. All this is a very positive and nothing negative at all 
description of Paul to Philemon. Now, don't you think this is somewhat a little bit inappropriate if Paul's trying to rebuke Philemon? It seems like Paul here is, you know, saying how wonderful Philemon is. But that, if Paul was trying to rebuke Philemon, this is certainly giving Philemon the wrong idea. At least it's giving me the wrong idea. It looks like he, right here that he's um, praising Philemon for being a good, a good and faithful person. But if he was rebuking Philemon, then Philemon wouldn't be faithful now, would he? He would be unfaithful and in need of rebuke. Um, so anyways, continue. Uh, so verse 8. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. Um, uh, hold on one second. Um, I am sending him back to you in person, that is, my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. So right there we see that Philemon was converted to the true faith through Paul. In Paul's belief, he converted Onesimus to the true faith, and that Paul's hope is that uh, Philemon accept uh, Onesimus as a brother uh, so that Onesimus can continue to do the work that Paul had commissioned Philemon to do. That would continue. Uh, verse 14, but without your consent I wanted to do nothing that your good deed might not be by compulsion as it were but voluntary. So right there Paul is trying to say, look, I am not trying to force you to free your slave here because he is your slave and you had the right to own him because slavery is not evil. And I don't believe it is and the scriptures don't teach it is either. So anyways, so he, Paul's saying, you know, what I'm asking you is you don't have to free your slave, but it would be a good if you did it voluntarily, God would honor you for that. That would be, like, in, a, in a sense, a fast. That would be supererogatory actions, which receive benefit in the next life. But again, it's not necessary. So right now, Paul is not trying to guilt trip Philemon here. He's saying, you don't have to do this, but if you want to, go right ahead, because you're going to get some extra points for this. So, verse 15. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you both in the flesh and in the Lord. So we learn that Onesimus had fled his master wrongly. He fled his master, um, so in other words, he was a disobedient slave. But then upon fleeing, apparently he somehow wound up in prison or something. And he was converted by Paul to the true faith. But now, once Miss is truly sorry and he wants to be truly forgiven by his master, but he's afraid. So Paul writes to Philemon and says, Overlook the faults of the wrongs that your, that your slave has done. Because maybe, even though this was a sin for one Smith to have fled from you, perhaps God used this to the good benefit, to, for the greater good, in that he finally became saved. And now, what is more important, him to be your brother or to him to be just your slave? His, being a brother in spirit is more important. So... Paul, um, so Philemon 
has now gained a brother. And so Paul is trying to tell him, we should celebrate this. You and I, let's celebrate this because this is a great, this is a good thing. This is a very good thing. Um, now, uh, I'm going to stop here and continue the rest of the next video. Thank you and shalom. Shalom, this is Anna Yahoo. This is part two in my commentary on the letter to Philemon. Now, in my series of Defending Paul, I had segment one. Now, for segment one, that was, uh, that was specifically about um, mainly trying to show that Paul was approved by all the apostles to throughout the entire life, and he was never rejected, but always accepted as a true follower of God. And that's why I did like part one, part two, part three, all the way to part 13. But for segment two, it's going to be a little different. It's not going to be part one, two, three, four, five, and go all the way to like, you know, however many there will be. But instead, it's going to go by letter. I'm mainly going to be doing commentaries on Paul in this segment. So, for instance, if I do a letter if i do a commentary on the letter to romans i'll start with part one and part two and keep going until it finishes and then if i go to another letter i'll start with part one again so for this particular letter by lehman this is part two and this is the last part of this letter so if that's it allow me to continue um in the previous letter I was doing commentary on Philemon, so now I'll leave off with where I left off. I'll start off with where I left off. Okay. Verse 17 reads, If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would, as you would me. Right there, we see that Philemon, according to Paul, think, uh, Paul thinks that Philemon... Uh, has a very high view of Paul because otherwise he wouldn't ask him if, if Philemon didn't like Paul then he wouldn't say receive him as he would me because then Philemon would receive him in a horrible way but Paul's entire letter is to help Winston's out so we see this shows that Paul thinks that Philemon sees him rather highly sees Paul rather highly. Um, and so Paul's saying is if you count me as your spiritual brother then this man I I am so uh, this this man's fate is so personal to me that I regard him as my own my own self my own person. So treat him as if he was me, because he is my heart. Now, I'll continue. Verse 18. But if he has wronged you uh, or owes you anything, put that on my account. That right there is a pretty significant statement. Basically, Paul saying whatever Onesimus owes his, his master... Give it to him. I mean, Paul will give it to him. If Philemon will will forgive and will look over the faults of Onesimus. So right there, that's a pretty powerful because we, we realize he's, Paul's promising to no matter what the price, no matter what the cost, I will pay it just so that my brother, Onesimus, will not be, um, will not have to pay this back. Basically, Paul's saying, you know, what, what if, what if Onesimus owed two million dollars? Paul's basically saying, even if Philemon owes two million dollars, Even if one Smith owes you, Philemon, $2 million, I will take that onto myself. I will become a slave if I have to. Just don't, don't 
don't uh, look down on Philemon. Uh, don't look down on Muslims for his past actions. That's what Paul is trying to say. That's a pretty powerful and uh, a pretty loving thing to do to offer something like that to someone. And so let's see here. Then verse 19 says, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. Normally Paul had a scribe write this, but apparently Paul wrote this himself with his own hand, indicating he was so involved in this, so personally invested in this issue that this was so important to him, he was going to write it himself. He wanted everyone to know that. And so, um, so, he, this is just so crucial for Paul. This, his, his spiritual brother is so important to him that he's willing to do anything to reconcile the two together. Now, in your understanding, Paul is rebuking once of this. In my understanding, excuse me, Paul's rebuking Philemon. In my understanding, Paul is not rebuking Philemon because Philemon doesn't even know what's going on. He probably hasn't even heard anything about his runaway slave. So Paul's basically saying, look, this is the lay down, this is the lowdown about what your former slave has been up to. He became saved, he converted. I understand that he did some wrong things and wronged you in several ways. Um, but now that you know that he's a true follower of God, I'm asking you that in the future, when he comes back to you, to to forgive him. So he's not, Paul is not, you know, uh, criticizing him for having a hardened heart. Rather, Paul is saying, do not in the future have a hard heart. So we see that's different. You understand it as rebuking. My understanding is exhortation. He's saying, in advance, he's saying, Philemon, I understand you guys had some issues in the past, and it was his fault, but please don't, I'm not saying you're gonna bear a grudge against him, but it's possible you might, you know, we all are able to sin, and so I just want you to not sin, so I'm telling you ahead of time to prevent you from sinning, because I love you as a brother, and I'm warning you ahead of time so that you don't have to repent of sinning. So this is in love and not in condemnation. Because you didn't do anything wrong yet. I'm just trying to help you, brother. That's how I understand Paul writing to Philemon. Now also, remember back I, I said, um, But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. Um, Philemon was wronged by one Smith because one Smith fled from him even though he was his slave um, and s slavery is not an evil thing slavery is a righteous thing according to the Bible and so I also believe this and so we see uh, that this what, what Paul says to Philemon here is not a bad thing but this is a good thing he's trying to love his brothers to the best of his abilities. Now, I will read um, the rest of verse 19. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Now, you when you quote this, you say, you owe me even your own soul besides. I went to Bible.cc, I think it's Bible.cc, or either that, or Bible.cc.com, and what that website does is you enter a verse and then it shows all the popular translations how they render that one specific verse. So I did that. And a few of them do render it, as you say, as soul. But most of them say self. So I was like, hmm, wait a minute. Soul is completely different than self. So which is correct? So I went to blueletter.com, blueletterbio.com, and I... 
looked at the Greek lexicon of the New Testament. And guess which Greek word they translated here? Guess what word it is? It's not the word for soul, it's the word for self. The translators, when they saw it, when they were translating, they said, you know what, this seems like it's describing the soul. So we're going to translate it as soul. This is how all translators do their translations. They don't translate it literally almost ever. They translate it mainly how they, what they think it's talking about, which is a wrong way of translating it. You should not translate it how you think, what you think it means. Rather, you, you should translate it what it says, regardless of what you think it means. So, in other words, an example of this would be, in a Hebrew text, it might say, and then God said to him. Well, that's what it says. But some translations change it from him, and if it's talking to Abraham, they might, they might change it, him to Abraham. Because they say, well, it means Abraham. That's what they do. That's their trans translation, quote-unquote. That's a horrible way of translating. The true way of translating is literal, not contextual. Translate it for what it says, not what you think it means, people. So we see here that your quotation of this verse is a bad translation. It's not, you owe me your very soul. It's, you owe me your, you, where was it? It's, um... You owe me even your own self, besides, you owe me your own self, not your soul. So there's a difference. Um, this doesn't have to be referring to spiritual conversion. This can be referring to a number of things. Um, this can be referring to the moral principle of you give something, I give something in return as a gratitude of thanks. Have you ever watched different movies in the past? I know you don't watch movies or like TV or anything like that, but in the past I'm sure you did. And there are many themes of someone saved your life or did something for you, not spiritually, but you know, physically they saved you from being murdered or something, or they did a really huge favor for you. So then that character says, I owe you big time and I'm going to... I will not forget this, and I'm going to pay you back for what you did, because you did a wonderful thing. That's how I understand this. I understand that we don't know what how it is, so that we just don't know how Philemon owed his self to Paul. It could be in any number of things. Financial transaction, could be, could be spiritual, but it could also be physical, a number of different things, but... We just can't say because the text doesn't let us know as far as i understand it doesn't so paul is basically saying uh you owe me a favor for what i did for you way back then and he doesn't say what it was but th that could be a very reasonable thing what if what if once once miss did owe him a favor and not referring to you know a spiritual thing but a physical thing i helped you out in your debt before and so you owe me financially so i will cancel your debt to me in exchange for you canceling your debt to uh once a miss see right there that's the idea here Paul is trying to, uh, he's not trying to do anything evil. He's not trying to, you know, rebuke Philemon for a sin. He's trying to exhort and protect his brothers and raise them up in the truth. And, and as I said, he's saying, you owe me a debt and I'm willing to, I'm willing to forgive your debt if you forgive once in this debt. And remember, as he said earlier, it's a voluntary thing. You don't have to forgive the debt. So, in the same sense, Paul does not have to forgive Philemon's debt. It's voluntary. So if they both agree, if Philemon agrees to forgive once Mrs. debt, and then Paul will forgive Philemon's debt. That's what it means. Um... So then, yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. 
Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. And then I'll just do one very small part three. Thank you, Angela. Shalom, Mr. Daniyahu. This was originally going to be a part three in my letter to Philemon, my commentary on the letter to Philemon, but uh, instead I'm going to do these things a little differently. And uh, I'm going to look at essentially all the, uh, the different writings of all the different letters of Paul, and I'm going to show you that what Paul's statements mean in his letters at the very end. Of them. Okay, so basically, at the end of every letter, we see, um, we see this, we see Paul say, generally, he'll say, greet so-and-so in the Lord, and, or he might say, salute this person, but he also will say, this person salutes you, so what does that mean? Salute this person, and this person salutes you. These are two very significant statements. The first one, salute this person, means that Paul believed when he wrote this letter that the people he would be saluting, he would, that would be saluted to, would accept this letter as authoritative and a true word of God. That's a significant belief of Paul. That is Paul's assumption that they agree with him on the content of the letter. Secondly, that when it says, this person salutes you, what Paul is saying is, this person salutes you through this letter I just wrote. In other words, I wrote this letter, and then this person came along, read the letter, and decided to send a salutation through it. In other words, when I when Paul says this person salutes you, you know, and what he really means is this person endorses this letter. That's a very significant thing. So with that said, let's read the very end of the letter to Philemon. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark. Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow laborers. That right there. They greet you. You know what that means? That means, as I just said, all those people endorse the letter to Philemon. So Epaphras, Mark, that's the, that's the Mark we all know and love. Mark endorses the letter to Philemon. He endorses the entirety of it. Aristarchus endorses it. Demas all these individuals were mentioned in the actually apostles as very important individuals in the early church. And finally, the, one of the most significant mentions, even more significant than, than Mark, is and Luke. Luke endorses the letter to Philemon. Luke, the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, he endorses the letter to Philemon. That's pretty significant right there. Wouldn't you think? You may not realize that pretty much all of Paul's letters have this kind of format, but they do. Now let's take a look at um. Let's take a look at uh, Paul's letter to First Corinthians and his conclusion. Hold on, one more. okay. Paul's letter to the First Corinthians, the conclusion. So we read. Um, okay, it says this, and starting with verse 19, 1 Corinthians, the last chapter. The churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you, greet one another with a holy kiss. So that right there, um, Aquila and Priscilla. 
very two prominent individuals in the early church, both endorsed the letter to 1 Corinthians. According to Paul, the, the churches of Asia, in other words, what that means is the bishops or the overseers of Asia, all of them, endorse this letter. In addition, the um, Aquila and Priscilla's church that is in their house, they endorse this letter. All the brothers that were with Paul at that time he wrote 1 Corinthians endorse 1 Corinthians. So we see that. Now let's move on to the next letter. 2 Corinthians. The very end of 2 Corinthians. We read... Um, well, it doesn't say anything. It just says, all the saints greet you. So in other words, all the saints with Paul greet you. That's 2 Corinthians. Romans chapter 16 is the most significant one of them all. Well, not most significant, but most, most lengthy. Here it says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. He assumes Priscilla and Aquila will, will upon reading Romans, they will accept the letter. They will endorse it. Not that they do endorse it, but that they will endorse it once, once they read it. Likewise, he says in verse 5, Greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Eponitus. Greet Mary. Greet Adronicus and Junia. Greet Amplius. Greet Urbanus and Statius. Greet Apelles. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian. Greet those of the household of Narcissus. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis. Greet Rufus. Greet his mother and greet my mother. Um, greet Asencritus. Phlegon. Hermes, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. The churches of Christ greet you. Um, well, actually it says all the churches, all the churches of Christ greet you. So here, Paul is pretty emphatic in his statement that this is universally uh, approved, this letter. Um, because the churches are greeting you through the letter to the Romans. Also, um, at the very end, we see that in verse 21, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Quartus, a brother. So, Timothy, Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, Tertius, Gaius, Erastus, and Quartus, all here, Paul says, endorse the letter to the Romans by Paul. That is so significant. We most people don't realize what these things are saying, but it's just it's right there. Um now let's see, Ephesians. I don't see anything in Ephesians, so I'll go to Philippians. So Philippians, let's see right there what we have. So here um Doesn't really mention anyone in Philippines either. So now we go to Colossians. Okay, Colossians. Um, so according to Colossians, it says, um, starting from verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you receive instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, 
These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. So, and then he says to greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus in the church that is in his house. But that right there shows that Paul claims that uh, Aristarchus, Mark, Barnabas, Justice, Epaphras, all those individuals endorsed the letter to the Colossians. Um, so that might that might be it for, for Paul's letters. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I think that's about it. But um, I'm just double checking. Okay, so. All right, so yeah, I think that's it for all of Paul's letters. But if you look at Paul's letters, the beginning of each of Paul's letters usually have a statement saying not just that Paul wrote the letter, but that someone else co-authored it with him. Some of uh, Paul's letters were co-authored, well, actually a majority of them were co-authored by Timothy. A couple were by Timothy and Silas. Silas co-authored letters with Paul. Um, so you see in the different letters Paul mentions, he says specifically not just that he wrote it, but that others wrote it alongside of him. In other words, co-authored. 1 Corinthians was co-authored by Sosthenes. Um, in like in the introductory chapter to each each of the letter letters of Paul, you will see that. So that right there, that just that is my explanation of the endorsement these these uh, personal remarks. These personal remarks, when I used to be a Protestant, I didn't really see any much value for. But now they're so crucial. They establish the history, the historical connection. These are the proofs of who endorses these letters, who, and who approves of Paul's message, and what Paul believes at the time he writes it. It's so much powerful evidence, historical evidence, that is. So, at any rate, that, is, uh, that, that should be about sufficient for my video on the endorsements the personal references in all of Paul's writings and the, how those personal references indicate that various, various true followers of God endorsed almost all of Paul's writings explicitly according to Paul himself. Anyways, that's the end of this video for now. Thank you and Shalom.